If you're successful, you're going to take office at a time when there's a multi-billion dollar deficit. Not afraid of the police unions. Look at my background, look at who I am. How would you expect to get that done? Basic income to lift people out of extreme poverty. Our proposal would be to expand child care. You know, I think you have to know who you are. We want to create 15-minute neighborhoods for every resident of this city. And we can do it. We can fix this city. This is your chance to meet the candidates. Please join us. Heaven just to sing a song for you. Hello, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you, Madam Leader. <laughs> okay. Loud and clear. <laughs> okay, great. All righty. Good evening, Brooklyn. Good evening. To everyone joining us this evening, thank you. I am Assemblymember Radnice Bichot. Hermland Chair of the Brooklyn Democratic Party. The Kings County Democratic County Committee represents over one 
1.1 million registered Democrats, making us one of the largest county parties in the nation. And I am also honored to serve as the first black woman to lead a county party in New York City. It is a sign of our party's progress that we are all here today. Tonight, you will hear from the candidates from three races, Brooklyn Borough President, Controller, and Mayor. And this will be the very first time these candidates debate. But before we begin our program, I want to thank our moderator, Brooklyn's very own Errol Lewis. Errol is a CNN political commentator and the host of New York One's Inside City Hall, a nightly political show on Spectrum News. We are honored to have him as the moderator for this evening's debate. I would also like to acknowledge and thank our debate committee, district leaders, county committee chair, Arlene Alvarado Makala, all the participating political clubs, and of course, the candidates themselves. Our city is facing an unprecedented crisis. The candidates we elect in June will be responsible for helping our city to recover from one of the worst economic crises of our time. And from a second pandemic, that of socioeconomic and racial inequities, which have long played our city and borough. Brooklyn, we heard you. And tonight, we are pleased to bring you together for this very important occasion, the first ever Brooklyn Democratic Party candidate debate. For the first debate, you will hear from the candidates from Brooklyn Borough President. Very soon, we will welcome Council Member Robert Carnegie, Kari Edwards, Kim Council, District Leader Anthony Jones, Council Member Matthew Jean, Shanduk McFadder, Council Member Antonio Reynoso, and Assemblywoman Joanne Simon. Please note that we have reached capacity, and this will be streamed live on the BK Dems YouTube and Facebook. All chats will only be enabled on YouTube and Facebook. Please join me in welcoming our fabulous Brooklyn moderator for this evening, Errol Lewis. Okay. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Madam Chair. And I wanna welcome everybody here to the Kings County Democratic Debates. I'm Errol Lewis. I'm the political anchor at Spectrum News, New York One. More importantly, I am a registered Democrat and a longtime resident of Crown Heights, and I'll be moderating tonight's discussion. Um, this first hour will be a discussion and debate among the leading candidates for Brooklyn Borough President. The powers of the Borough President, as spelled out in the city charter, include appointing members of the borough's community boards and overseeing the process by which those boards participate in planning and land use decisions. The borough president also has input, input and influence over capital spending decisions in Brooklyn, generally acts as the spokesperson for the needs of the 2.7 million residents of our borough. Uh, the incumbent borough president, Eric Adams, is term limited and will not be seeking reelection. Tonight, you will hear from several candidates who are seeking that office. They are in alphabetical order. Robert Carnegie, who currently represents the 36th district in the city council. Kim Council, a community activist and administrator at a large law firm. Kari Edwards is a lead coordinator of the East Brooklyn Call to Action campaign and former vice president of external affairs at Brookdale Hospital. Matthew Eugene currently represents the 40th district in the city council. Anthony Jones is the male district leader of the 55th assembly district. Chan Duke McFadder is a community activist who is the founder of GMAC, which stands for Gangsters Making Astronomical Community Change. Antonio Reynoso currently represents the 34th district in the city council, and Joanne Simon represents the 52nd district in the New York State Assembly. So now the rules for this discussion are as follows. We're not going to have opening statements. Um, generally, candidates will have 45 seconds to respond to each of my questions. There may be follow-up questions for clarity. Rebuttals to questions are limited to 30 seconds and can continue at my discretion. Uh, we're also going to have a cross-examination round in which each candidate will be allowed to ask one question to one of his or her rivals and get a one-minute response. 
All candidates will be offered a chance to join the discussion of each major subject area as we seek the main goal tonight, which is a substantive discussion of how candidates intend to tackle important issues facing New York in general and Brooklyn in particular. So with all of that in mind, let's get to our first discussion on the topic of the pandemic. I wanna ask each candidate to identify the single action that you took during the pandemic, public action, I mean, of course, that best illustrates what you will do if elected as borough president. So I wanna go in alphabetical order. Let's start with you, Mr. Carnegie. Uh, thank you, Errol Lewis, uh, for that question. Um, we started Wellness Wednesdays in mid-March, right after I was diagnosed with the COVID virus and have begun to feed over 500 families every single Wednesday to date. We go into the housing developments. Most recently, we were in uh, Tompkins and Marcy and Roosevelt houses, uh, making sure that we combat food insecurity for those families who found themselves without the ability to return to work and without the supplemental um, um, needs being met. So we immediately got on the ground and met the most visceral needs and the most immediate needs, which is food insecurity and continue to do that to date because largely those families, especially in our NYCHA developments have not had the opportunity to return to work. Okay, thank you for that reply. Kim Council. Uh, we also, uh, I also actually worked uh, to deliver food. Uh, we uh, had, um, actually we were doing a, uh, through a mutual aid organization, we were delivering food in East New York, actually going door to door delivering food to uh, Fiorentino Plaza and to um, Ocean Hill Houses, and also serve at least 100 uh, boxes of food every week uh, at our pantry at the Berean Community and Family Life Center. So we saw that the food lines were increasing, and so we worked to uh, expand the, the ability to, to give food to people in the community. Mm -hmm. uh, Kari Edwards. Well, I, I actually lived through the pandemic on a personal note. I uh, worked at Brookdale Hospital, losing over 660 people to this virus. Um, more, of, more of my work was national. I called in CNN to uh, expose the fact that we had no PPE. We had no uh, means of taking care of our patients, let alone our workers. Uh, subsequent to that, I personally um, also delivered food, but more importantly, we started doing COVID tests in every community in Brooklyn. So we were in Bay Ridge, we were all the way in East New York, uh, Brownsville and Bushwick, um, because part of the pandemic issue is how do we get out of it, but also keep people safe. Mm -hmm. Next up is uh, Mr. Eugene. Thank you very much, uh, well, thank you. You know, what I've done, I've done all those things also, giving food to the community, people in the community. And most especially, we got to remember what brings us to this situation. This is a health crisis. And I've been reaching out to the medical centers, the hospital in my district, and also the doctors, even the chairman of the, the president of the Health and Hospital Corporation to make sure that we understand that we have to make sure that Brooklyn is ready. And I introduced legislation before that to raise my concern about the preparedness and readiness of New York City to end a pandemic, epidemic like COVID-19. And the Dr. Katz agreed with me that we have to do exactly what I asked through my legislation that I introduced in 2018 we have to make sure that we extend the capacity of the hospital, create new units in order for us to be able to treat people with infectious disease. And most importantly, this is not the first one. It is not going to be the last one. And what I'm pushing right now, as we try to get rid of COVID-19, we have to be prepared, prepared for the next one because the viruses have the capacity to mutate. We have already seen several mutations. We have to make sure we prepare. And that's the reason why also I introduced legislation to ask the federal government to create a permanent commission to continue to study viruses and to make sure that we are ready for the next one. Okay, uh, thank you. Mr. Jones. Yes, during, during that time, uh, uh, giving out food is fine. But unless you've been a victim and experienced COVID, one of the things you know about COVID is that 
oftentimes it takes away your food appetite. So I was able to get thousands of, of, of masks uh, as, as well as hand sanitizers. And what I did is I targeted areas that I knew that people congregate, particularly in beauty salons and barbershops, people coming out of the train stations, people getting on the bus and letting people know the importance of washing hands, using the sanitizer and wearing the mask. Because again, when you have firsthand experience that, and I had it twice, one of the things you must uh, let people know in terms of prevention is wearing that mask. So that's what I did throughout Brooklyn is give out masks and hand sanitizers. Okay. Uh, Mr. Reynoso. Well, uh, I was able to author and pass the outdoor dining legislation, which is arguably the most, uh, the, the most significant piece of legislation passed by the city council uh, throughout this pandemic when it comes to the assistance of small businesses. Because of it, we were able to give them a lifeline. Um, I, of course, we, wouldn't, we weren't able to save them all, uh, but in the legislation, we were able to build equity. We didn't ask people to pay. We didn't ask where you're from. Everyone got an opportunity to put out the, to put a, a outdoor dining in front of their businesses. Um, and we were able to reimagine spaces uh, for small businesses. Uh, and I believe that that uh, outside of giving out masks, uh, giving food, giving uh, the, um, and, and supporting our 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 folks that are um, most affected on the ground. Uh, passing legislation is the primary function of a legislator, and I was able to do that. Think outside the box and get it done. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Miss Simon. There we go. Thank you, Errol, um, and uh, thank you to uh, everyone at home who's, who's watching tonight. Uh, you know, the first thing that I did as a state legislator, of course, is uh, really work very hard with um, uh, people about unemployment insurance and other benefits, and we distributed PPE, hand sanitizer, and support the efforts of mutual aid groups and other groups with regard to uh, distribution of clothing and, of course, food. So those are the primary things that I did. Obviously, legislatively, we passed a number of bills that respond to the COVID crisis in a variety of ways and are continuing to do that. And I'll be continuing to, to do that this year and uh, to support efforts uh, at all levels of government to provide support for, for people who've been impacted by COVID. Okay, thank you candidates. Uh, I wanna to talk to you about uh, for a little bit about the powers of the office. And uh, this is based on a question from Arlene Alvarado. You forgot to They always forget me. I'm sorry? I'm always forgotten. I didn't get the question. Oh, um, Shanduk was um, Mr. McFadder, go ahead. Thank you, underdog, it's all right. So uh, I appreciate the time. I appreciate the opportunity to speak on this. As an organizer, a community leader, I realized that one of the first things that was important is when people lose jobs, crime rises. So we wanted to make sure that the young people had opportunities. We worked to secure funding for young people to do something around that time. We work with community organizations to be able to provide something called social diplomats to educate the community on the importance of social distancing, especially in areas which is NYCHA housing that have no parks, no playgrounds, no community centers, and just a bunch of gathering to prevent any type of uh, anything that happened with NYPD as far as people who don't understand the importance of social distancing. We partner with different community organizations like Brooklyn Foundation, uh, Murray Avenue Bid and others, Laurie Cumbo, to provide food and resources to the neighborhood that we have been working in, where we've done hot food drive, cold, cold drives, cold drives, as well as making sure that we provide PPE, not just to the direct community, but to families and small community-based organizations who are looking to provide PPE to the community. So it is, we continue to educate up until today what is important to our community around COVID and prevention of the pandemic. Okay. You know, while I have you, Mr. McFadder, have you served on a community board at any point? No, I, I'm currently on a board of directors where I live. It's a co-op that has shareholders and I'm on the board of directors there. But other than that, I've never served on any community boards. Understood. Okay. In fact, uh, that brings me to my next question, which is, um, a question that came from Arleni Alvarado-McCalla, the uh, female leader from the 54th district. And um, her question was, 
what will you do to revamp how community boards review zoning variances through EULER, the Uniform Land Use Review Procedure? What training you, will you provide and will you commit to providing trainings about zoning and workshop for boards and especially for land use committees of those boards? Uh, let's get a, uh, a, a quick, let's give it uh, like say 30 second answers uh, from each and we'll go um, in reverse order. So we'll start with you, Ms. Simon. Go. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, yeah, it's a great question. Uh, that is one of the, the main things that uh, community boards do. So my basic uh, belief is that communities need to be at the table from the beginning, and we need community-based planning. And unfortunately, ULERP, which is primarily what the community boards are faced with, is really a very top-down procedure, and it really needs to be the other way. So number one, we really need to educate our community board members and provide them with technical assistance by people who can actually help them understand what they need to do and ask the right kinds of questions of developers so they can really better assess the projects and better understand, for example, uh, those very complicated environmental uh, impact statements, which are very lengthy. Um, and uh, that is one of the, the main things we can do uh, is to do that and also to um, bring onto community boards people with experience in these areas, uh, community-based experience in working on, in affordable housing and having dealt with uh, development issues because the biggest problem we have is, is uh, displacement of people through the development process. And we need to work very, very carefully on that. Okay, uh, let, and let me, uh, for uh, you, Mr. Reynoso, I'll tighten up the question a little bit. What she's getting at, I think uh, as well is, um, do we need to change the way the boards interact with the, the Euler process? Uh, we do. Um, currently, the Euler process is a developer led process. Uh, the community board actually has very little influence or power when it comes to their ability to change uh, a land use project that has been presented to them by a developer first. So what I would do is actually ask community boards to join in the fight to reform uh, or get rid of ULERP and to push for comprehensive planning. Uh, in comprehensive planning, they would be able to have a seat at the table in the beginning of the conversation, not at the end after a developer has already done the work. So I would change the EULA process and then educate and inform and use workshops uh, to empower uh, the community board uh, members so they can actually affect change in a meaningful way. Got it. And uh, Mr. McFadder, the specific uh, uh, question is uh, includes uh, whether or not candidates like you will uh, commit to providing training for uh, the community boards on land use questions. I'm, I'm somebody who's very big on training and the work I do, I've trained people for years. So if we're not trained on something, we don't know how to respond to it effectively. When we look at land use, there's so many different questions that are up that we have to really put on the table and ask ourselves who's been in these conversations up till now, right? This has been a problem for so long. Community boards have people been on the boards for years who continue to push the same narrative. So not just the training, but revamping, not just what the start looks like, but from the small community board that don't have a young person who understands what rezoning, what zoning is. Yeah, and uh, Mr. Jones, um, communities change over time. You know, who lives in a given community board uh, changes over the decades. Uh, there's been a challenge, as, as uh, Mr. McFadder suggests, in making sure that uh, all voices are being heard at the community board level. What, what strategies would you use to ensure uh, broad involvement from all communities? Well, one of the things that we must do, and, and, and I'm happy that you asked that question because uh, as a young man, I served on community board three. I was appointed by Howard Golden. I was about uh, 19 years old. I was the youngest member on the community board. And training is very, very important. But what also is important is that part of the training that we give new people who are coming on the community board, we have to get some of the people who have been serving on these community boards for long, long periods of time who have the information and have the knowledge. I was honored uh, to serve uh, under uh, uh, Marjorie Matthews when she was a community board chair of three and I was the chair of the youth services committee. And one of the things that I would put on the application is that anybody who's interested in being on a community board that there will be a training process. It may be a three-day training. I would like to include the training from going to, from the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the planning commission, because once there's some land that's available and the proposal is held and it's discussed at a community board, it has to go back to the planning commission. And then from there, 
once the community board takes care of business and holds a, a, a meeting about it and sends it back to them, it goes to the borough president, it also goes to the borough board. So we wanna make sure that the people who are coming in make it a mandate that they understand what the importance of the ULOC, uh, ULOC uh, uh, Land Use Committee does, how important it is, and if people are not properly trained, how their, the land that's vacant in their community can you be usurped by developers and put, that's how uh, uh, these high condominiums and, and, and places where the rent is too high, where people can't live. So under my administration as the Brooklyn Borough President, it will be a mandate, at least a three-day training mandate for anybody who wants to be on that community board. Right, very good. Mr. Eugene, as a council member, you've appointed uh, lots and lots of uh, community board members over the years. What changes are needed, both in the, the powers that they have and the, the process by which you would uh, find them and, uh, if necessary, give them orientation and training? And thank you very much, Joel, for this question. This is a very important one. Of course, uh, we have to make sure that the members of the community board receive training. They can understand the land use process. And also what I would, what I would do, I would create the environment for the members of the community board to interact, to discuss, to have additional meeting and session among them to give their thought because each district is different. The need of land use is different in each district. It's not the same thing. The community board members should get together and exchange comment and conversation to, for the full board to have a better uh, understanding and uh, on the situation of each district. But what I would do also, most of the time, what I saw in the community board, because I've been a member of the community board for many years, when there is a euro process, a upzoning or some land use issue, the members of the community, they come to the community board, but they are not aware of the process. They don't know really the process. They want to see the best for their community. They don't want to be displaced. They know what they need for the community. I think that we got to extend the training also to the mm -hmm. members of the community in order for them to have a better idea what is a Europe process, what that means exactly, and what time they have to intervene and what they have to do to have the voice heard. Okay, Mr. Edwards. I mean, I, I'd like to blow up some stuff, right? I would like to uh, go back to 1975 and change the charter where the community boards lost their vote on ULERT processes. I think that it shouldn't be a recommendation. I think it should be a vote very early in the process um, because I think what, we're do, what we are losing is that community touch. Another thing that I'd like to do is when we, when we recruit or we, when we look at these hundreds of applications that the borough president's office get, I would like to create a, a system just like this, right? A, a system where we are able to have folks literally work to understand or a committee, a steering committee, a screening committee that we actually get to put folks on the board who really want to do the work and understand the work. That second point after that is then we put them through a boot camp. If you want to become a part of the youth services, if you want to become a part of the health services, we put you through a boot camp as a member of the community board so you get trained up so that you understand the process. And lastly, let's talk about what Mr. Jones said when he was 19. I like to see us expand the board for 14 to 18 years old, start getting them trained in the civics process of community boards. And let us really start to look at how, like you said, the community changes, but I've lived in my community my whole life. And I would have loved to have that tutelage early in my life. So I think those are the three steps that I would like to do. But first, I'd like to get the community board an actual vote. In well, language. yeah, and just to be clear, Mr. Edwards, what you're talking about is um, moving it from uh, an advisory committee to a binding vote at some point in the land use process? Yes, er, er, and early, meaning like as, as the developers come to present, it's not just that we run hearings, but what we basically do as a community board is to say, you know what, this really is not working. We're not building enough units here. How do we allow this in so before it even gets to the um, planning commission? Got it. Okay, Ms. Council. So um, I think training is, is very important, but I also think it's important that we have community input from the beginning. And so this is why we have a lot of pushback in a lot of the projects that we have. So before we even get to that whole process of new love, the developers need to have community input at the very beginning. So we need to revamp the whole process of how we go about before the scope hearings and all those other kinds of things go into place. We definitely need to make sure that the people who are coming on the community board are trained, 
We also need to make sure that the people who are on the community board are representative of the people in the community. So again, not top down, but from the people from the community are deciding who is on that board so that the community board is reflective of the diversity of the community which it represents. I also would like to create a junior community board. Uh, one of the things that we often do in church is we begin to prepare our young people as they are younger to take over. We have junior deacons, we have junior trustees to be, so that they can begin to understand the process. So I would like to have a separate junior uh, community board in each district so that we can begin to prepare our young people so that they are familiar with the process of government. Mm. Well, Mr. Cornegy, uh, not only have you appointed a bunch of uh, community board members in your role as a council member, you also chaired the housing committee. So you've seen this uh, at work uh, borough wide. What changes, if any, do you think we should make? Well, before I answer that, first of all, I want to say, um, yeah, before I answer that, first of all, I want to say big shout out and congratulations and thank you to the many men and women who work on our community boards on a volunteer basis. That's not a paid role. And especially in, in community board eight, community board three, and community board two, which are a part of my council district, I know that there are hardworking men and women who dedicate themselves to seeing through a process that allows them to participate and their communities to participate. So before we throw out the baby with the bathwater, I just wanna say thank you to the men and women. I'm a former community board member and I worked my butt off unpaid to make sure that we, had, we were representative in the community. And I'm certainly from the community and so was everybody else on the community board. So before we go any further, thank you so much to the men and women who spend, count, if you're at community board three, you there till 9, 30, 10 o'clock at night, um, hashing out issues, liquor licenses, and, 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 and the land use folks are very capable in community board three, eight and two. So I don't know about the rest of the, the city, but we have very capable community members. Does training need to take place? Absolutely. And currently as the, as the chair of housing and buildings, I'm working on reforms to the ULERT process to make sure that it's more user friendly and to make sure that there's more input from the beginning. So I agree with the, I agree with that there should be training, but I don't think we should throw out the baby with the bathwater. There are hard men and women hardworking men and women who committed themselves to this process. And although there needs to be reforms, we need to not disrespect the people who work really hard to make sure that their community boards and their respective communities are reflective and they do the hard work. So okay. yes, we should have reforms. I'm working on reforms on the ULER process. I hope to work with my colleagues. I've, I've talked to Antonio about it. Um, I've talked to Nidia Velasquez about it. I really want to, from the, from the chair housing and buildings perspective, make the ULERP process more reflective of the communities. So I intend to, to continue to do that with not only um, my colleagues who are here, but my colleagues on the state and the federal level as well. Okay, thank you for that response. Okay, candidates, it is time for our cross-examination. We're gonna spend a few minutes. Uh, and in this section, each candidate will be allowed to direct one question to one other candidate and we'll give that person one minute to respond. And that's the whole exchange, right? We're not looking to, 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 to start a back and forth, but we'll give you a chance to ask somebody something that you think maybe they ought to give us an answer on and we'll, we'll see what they have to say about it. Uh, let's, let's uh, actually, let's start with you, Mr. Cornegy. So my question is for Antonio Reynoso. Hey, hey brother. <laughs> no, 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 we're gonna, be, we're gonna be easy, but my question is nah, for yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Listen. Famously, I'm a parent of six. And during my tenure in the council, I've missed birthdays. Well, actually my daughter has celebrated her birthday in council chambers at least three years in a row because she's a June baby and that's budget time. Um, and as a father of two beautiful new babies, which I attribute solely to your wife, um, how will you balance new parenthood and new fatherhood with a commitment to the entire borough of Brooklyn? Uh, thank you. Thank you for, for that question, Robert. Um, and look, I'm a new father, so I'm learning every day um, on how to be a, a better father. Um, and I'm going to be very clear and, and note to all of Brooklyn that my family is going to come first. I want to make sure my kids remember me in a positive light and that the job that I'm doing doesn't, doesn't uh, overtake my responsibilities and my duties as a father. Um, but I want to be smart about how I can involve them in the work that I'm doing when I'm representing Brooklyn. And I wanna allow for an example is every staff member in Brooklyn Borough Hall should have free childcare. We should allow for access um, for uh, parents that uh, of the members that work in Borough Hall to be able to leave their kids in Borough Hall. We should be able to establish that citywide actually, but at least in City Hall, um, especially when it comes uh, to, to mothers and the work that needs to be done to give them a fair shot at uh, being able to, 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 to succeed um, in our borough. So I'm gonna make sure that I 
surround myself in an environment that is conducive to my children, to conducive to me being a father. And I'm going to make sure that everybody gets to, to, to eat off of that. So um, trust me, Borough Hall is going to look a lot different with a dad in, 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 in it. Okay, that, that, that'll certainly sell at home. Thank you for that, that response. <laughs> Ms. Council, you can ask a question of one of your uh, opponents here. Mr. Carnegie, um, I want to ask you a question, but I don't want to don't want to mess with your fraternity stuff. So I'm going to ask you a question about NYPD budget. Um, uh, 2021 budget was really smoke and mirror cuts to the NYPD, and you oppose further cuts uh, because of rising crime in our communities, what you said. Uh, maintaining that funding did not reduce crime. So how do you defend investing in an agency that abuses people of color, um, abuses defenders of the rights of people of color, um, does not protect black and brown communities adequately when that money could be spent on programs that actually help people of color, like social service programs? Oh, it's not, they're not mutually exclusive. First of all, I'm a PAL kid. Anybody who knows who PAL is, is the Police Athletic League. I grew up in a Police Athletic League where they invested in a program through their resources that help young people. And without PAL, I wouldn't be a council member, quite frankly. Um, I invested in a budget that actually took care of our seniors. So, so it, it, wasn't, it wasn't smoke and mirrors. We've been working on shifting the balance of resources into quality programs from day one. And uh, I didn't want it to be punitive. We should be doing that because we're good fiscal stewards, not to try to punish the police department. They're two different narratives. If you want to shift the balance of money into programs that I'm for hundred percent. Trying to do that in a punishment process seems absolutely ridiculous. So we should absolutely be shifting resources of a $6 billion budget, one of the most inflated budgets. There are programs in the police department that do not deserve our, serve our communities. But for you to say, and for other people to say that we wanna punish bad behavior by taking away money, that's not where I'm at. I'm, I'm with moving the money because it's necessary to move money to create programs, but they're not mutually exclusive. So uh, you framed it in a way that, that actually people keep framing it over and over again. There are bad police, so we should take money. No, there should be police accountability, which I stand for 100%. I am a co-sponsor of the, of the um, Eric Garner chokehold bill. Okay. There were three sponsors on that, myself, Jemani Williams, and Rory Lansman. So I stand for police accountability. We just signed a bunch of police accountability bills. Okay. Um, we need to tease the two apart, police accountability and, and, and moving resources to make sure that communities are safe simultaneously. And then I'm sorry, Errol, lastly, I don't get the luxury of having a conversation that defunds the police when I got one-year-old babies being shot and 70-year-old women being shot in the face in, in the same span of six months. We mm -hmm. need to be working with our law enforcement to bring safety to our communities, okay. but it's not mutually exclusive to demand police and criminal right. justice reform and to support the men and women who go to work every single day, which there are the majority to do two things, okay. serve in their communities and return home safely to their family. Got it. Mr. Edwards. All right, well, I had, I had a question for Rob in that respect too. Um, so I was wondering if I could add on to Kim's question, but still ask Joanne hers. I don't no, no, I no, just pick one. All right, so uh, Assemblywoman Simon, um, just looking at how you started late in the process of raising money and were able to lend yourself 125,000 where most of us had to do it the old fashioned way. We just wanna know how will you be able to really represent an entire borough that the median income is about 34,000 across different parts of Brooklyn. Whereas I took off COVID not to raise any money. I know Kim Council did as well. And even though some of my other colleagues raised during COVID, getting late in the game doesn't kind of excuse the fact that you're able to do something that a lot of these candidates don't. So I just want to know how, how are you going to represent a borough that has issues that are across the board that we can't do the same thing? Well, thank you for that question, Carrie. Uh, so here's the thing, you know, um, I had looked at this race and I decided that, uh, you know, when COVID happened that my first obligation was to my constituents and the people in the communities that, uh, that needed our help. Uh, so I got into this race a little late, as you may know. And so this was a little insurance policy that I was able to loan myself. As you may notice, 
I have raised uh, virtually the same amount of money from uh, more people. Uh, I have uh, over 800 uh, unique donors, over 80% of which are coming from Brooklyn, over 90% are, are coming from New York City. So in fact, I have a, a very strong grassroots campaign, haven't touched that money, and it's, it was there to be an insurance policy. And of course, according to the rules, you know, I have to pay it back. So I'll be paying it back uh, before the end of the, before the primary. Okay. Uh, Mr. Eugene. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Mr. Shanduk. Uh, I heard that you have been talking about young people. That means uh, I believe that uh, you are concerned about the, the well-being and also the success of the young people. Uh, we have been seeing in the community, all over New York, juvenile delinquency, crime among young people. But I do believe as somebody who, has, who, who spent uh, all his life to educate, to provide opportunities to the young people, I do believe that those young people, they are not bad people. They just need opportunities. They need the mentoring. They need training. Right now, I have a program at the corner of Bedford Avenue and Church Avenue in my district, in a free land, a land, empty land. I'm going to create affordable housing and also vocational school and training for young people. Question? But it is in my district. But I believe we should extend that all over New York City. What will you will do to join me to extend this type of program in other district in Brooklyn? Okay. Hey, uh, so if you know my background, I haven't been in this work all my life. For the last 10 years, I've been doing this work 10 plus. I founded my organization in 2012 and I focused on uh, prevention, violence prevention first and foremost. Because when we talk about police accountability, we have to talk about the fact that police responds after they get the call of a crime. And that doesn't stop the crime. We have to prevent the crime from happening. So the way we prevent the crime from happening is to work with the youth who have been ostracized and told that they're criminals and they have no opportunities in life. And we have to create those opportunities for them. So I've done that. I've helped create entrepreneurs, not just teaching a young person how to, to do a resume and to work for someone, but to turn into entrepreneurs. I've help over 30, 40 young people in this past year receive their own business licenses to be able to do such, right? To teach, take them through COVID and had them on Zooms that give them the education and skills to do so. And I've traveled throughout Brooklyn and New York City doing such. So it is important to me to look at when we talk about some of the things that I was mentioned around the community board, even with Kim Council, that's major to me to put these young people in front of these boards, right? I may not necessarily want to separate them with a a uh, young person uh, board, but encompass them sitting down with the elders who have the experience and being able to work together to shift the dynamics on what it looks like for them. Because if their voice is not in the conversation, if they're not being um, asked how they feel and what they need, then we'll never make change in our bubble around changing how our young people respond to conflicts. Okay, um, Mr. Jones, your question. Uh, my question is to Councilman Carnegie and one of the things as the council member, uh, if we notice that gentrification hasn't stopped, it's just on a pause because of the pandemic. Uh, developments that are being built that people can't afford to live in hasn't stopped, it's just been paused. It's flourished in your district, gentrification. Under your leadership as borough president, is that something that Brooklyn would have to look forward to? So we are the epicenter of gentrification and gentrification. Part of gentrification is actually um, uh, displacement through uh, higher rents. That is a real estate and that's secular. So it's not exclusive to my district, but we have fought back against it by providing affordability to our middle class. Quite frankly, in my district, I'm not losing as many poor people that I am as the middle class. So really we have to make sure that we have mixed income housing for folks. If you're a bus driver, and a nurse in my district, you can't live here because while we have subsidies for the poor and we have the ultra rich, I've been working very diligently to make sure that we don't have a tale of two districts. So what you see in terms of gentrification in our district is really not on pause just because of the pandemic, it's because of the work that we put in from my office to ensure that there are multiple, um, uh, multiple uh, income bands within this district. 
So while we're, we're while we are certainly the epicenter, but our epicenter has to do with deed theft and deed fraud, the misuse of the lien sale list as well, and the misuse of the third party transfer program, which I've totally reformed. And the third party transfer program as it existed in the past, which contributed to some gentrification is no longer the way it was. So uh, we're not, gentrification is not exclusive to my district, but if you look at how we've been able to put it on pause, not because of the pandemic, but because of the work we've done around income ranges for developments in our district, that's why uh, gentrification is where it is. So I'm glad you pointed out the pause, but the pause is not, a, not attributed to the pandemic, it's attributed to the hard work we've done to make sure that the hardworking, working men and women have access to good quality ho uh, housing as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, we're up to Mr. McFadder. Thank you. Uh, Simon, uh, following up with the question around what you were able to do to get yourself into this late race. I'm in the uh, race late as well, and I definitely i am not able to fund myself to do this work. But it, it, it puts you in a different place when we talk about the residents of New York City who don't meet that financial uh, qualification. The question I have is, in the, in the seat of a borough president, is it a goal of yours to continue to shut down businesses that you may not understand with the way they are working, right? Well, an example I'd like to use, if you, you signed on to shutting down Woodland because there was controversy, it was a oh. resident, it had a lot to do with black people who went to Woodland to enjoy brunch. And because there was a lack of communication with the community and Woodland, that you signed on to that. Is that something that we would look forward to if you would get to see the bubble president? You know, I'm really glad you asked that question because that is a situation that was terribly, terribly misunderstood. We worked with Woodland for years, the community, the local elected officials. In reality, it was not a black owned business, by the way, and it did not discriminate against anybody who was black, um, who wanted to have brunch uh, in the area. And the next door neighbor is a black owned business with a thriving brunch business and very, very well uh, accepted by the community and is a, a hop in place. So the reality is this was an owner that was uh, violating the law uh, repeatedly over a period of years and would not work with um, either the elected officials or the community the same way that the next door neighbor, uh, which is Sugarcane, um, uh, did. And the reality is that area, very open, very welcoming to, uh, to uh, black patrons. And, um, you know, uh, I, I think that this is just something that was uh, misunderstood. And there was a good deal of misrepresentation about the situation. So so the answer to your question is no, of course not. I have done everything I can to support local businesses and, to, and will continue to do so. Okay, thank you. Mr. Reynoso. Uh, my question is for Assemblywoman Simon as well. Um, in New York City, the rezonings, uh, the rezonings in New York City have happened almost exclusively in black and brown poor districts throughout all of New York City. There's a rezoning that is uh, happening in your district now in the Gowanus rezoning Mm -hmm. um, that is about to come up and it's a white affluent district. Uh, what we want to know is that uh, are we expected to think that the burden of building our way out of this crisis of housing fall only on the black and brown faces that you might see on the screen? Or are you going to be supportive of the project in Gowanus that would finally be the first, the first rezoning happening in a white affluent district? So I guess by that you're not concerned about toxicity because I am concerned about toxicity for communities of color as well as everybody else. And so my concern about that project is we need to look at all aspects of it and we need to better understand how that cleanup will in fact work and work to the benefit of anybody who would be living uh, somewhere within that Gowanus rezoning. As you know, I'm the only local elected official that has actually supported that the need for a rezoning at that site. Most of the other elected officials do not support that. And so um, I think that your question is a bit misplaced, but let me just tell you about de community-based development. At Hoyt Skimmerhorn, we took what was an urban renewal area that people were parking lots that people fought over for years and created 37 and percent low to moderate income housing. We did that in a way that was consistent with what the community needed and wanted. 
and also provided that very affordable housing to people. And the reality is, A, it's very, very diverse. And I would like to just uh, share with you that there's a perception that, that my community is not diverse. But in fact, I've worked with the coalition, the Gowanus Coalition of Neighborhood Justice on all of the, uh, the issues that I think you're probably responding to. So I've been working closely with communities of color and working closely with them in terms of economic and racial and um, climate justice. So uh, I think you may have uh, decided something on your own that isn't in, in entirely accurate, but I am going to be watching and working with communities, all of the communities in my district with regard to that zoning. And as you know, as a state elected official, I have zero to say about uh, that, that rezoning, right? That is something that's gonna come before the city council. And, and the next borough president. And the next uh, borough president. Ms. Ms. Simon, you, uh, you get to uh, ask a question as well. So, um, M Antonio, <laughs> I'll ask you a question right back, okay? Now I've noticed that um, only 52% of your donors are Brooklyn residents. And I wanna ask you, how are you gonna represent every corner of our borough when almost half of your supporters come from outside of Brooklyn? Mm. Well, Joanne, um, unlike you, uh, my base um, doesn't come from a lot of money. I come from an immigrant family that just got here from the Dominican Republic in less than uh, 30 years ago. So because of it, I haven't been able to build a network that could help fund a campaign in the millions of dollars. So I have the most donors in this race, more donors than anyone else that's on this screen in front of you. I also have the least the, the, the donors that have paid the least, under $100 for each of my donations um, in the borough president's office. So again, I'm showing that I'm gonna be able to raise money in low dollar amounts from tons of people. And because my network is not strong, I gotta reach every single corner of this earth to try to compete versus uh, members like you that do have deep pockets and are able to finance your own campaign with a $125,000 loan that I'm not able, that I'm not able to, to take out. Um, and I don't think any other member that's sitting in front of here would be able to go to a bank and get a $125 loan for a borough president campaign. So because of it, I'm trying to be creative and I'm trying to be smart about how I get my funding. And uh, the 52% number is not a correct number. And um, I'll make sure that after this, I'll show people exactly how many donations I got from the borough of Brooklyn. Okay, fair Can enough. Thank you, candidates, for all of that. Um, we're, we're coming down the home stretch. We got less than 10 minutes. So I'm going to ask everybody to keep their answers very, very crisp. Um, this next one, in fact, I want to start by asking um, uh, the free, first people I want to have weigh in, and then we'll broaden the discussion. But I want to hear from uh, Mr. Reynoso, Mr. Eugene, and uh, Mr. Carnegie uh, about the industry city rezoning, uh, because there was a council vote on that. What position did you take on it? And it's, it's not a dead issue. What would you try to make happen if elected borough president? Very quick answers, please. And we'll uh, start with you, Mr. Carnegie. As a borough president, I'm going back to the table to renegotiate a deal that would bring between 8,000 and 20,000 jobs plus ancillary jobs to the community. That project had a pathway to, to those jobs through educational facilities, either a SUNY or CUNY campus there. I believed in that project. I wanted that project to happen. I think in this economic downturn, we have a responsibility as legislators to do the hard work to create jobs. I'm not an economist, but I do understand that the way out of a recession, which we find ourselves in right now, is through job creation. Okay, Mr. Eugene. I, I think, you know, um, as we are trying to resolve or to overcome this crisis, there's a very important thing that we got to take in, keep in mind. Also jobs opportunities to make sure that we get back on track and people can have opportunity to have a good paying job also. And also that it will be able to maintain their family, bring the food on, on the table and pay the roof over the head. It is very important that we look into this project very deeply to make sure that what is the best thing that we can do, not only to benefit the people in the community and also to make sure that the, the, the result, the impact doesn't affect negatively the life of the people in the neighborhood. Okay, Mr. Reynoso. I thought you asked, what was your, what was your vote, sir? I, I did yeah. vote, yeah. So, um, Arrow, you just asked a question uh, probably three questions ago about what people would do here related to community boards. And everyone talked about empowering community boards to make a decision um, as to the, 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 what they want to see in their community, right? And they all said that they would give them a vote. The community board voted this down. So in, in, in doing so, 
uh, almost every single member that's on this call, again, would have voted it down. Um, so if you're going to talk about empowering communities and making sure the community boards have a vote, then you would have voted against the, uh, the, the project. So I voted against the project because the community came out very strongly against it. And what we need to do is, again, start a process where the community makes the decision as to what it wants to see, the right to self-determination. For too long, Black and brown communities don't get to choose what their communities look like. And I wanted them to get a shot at doing that first. That yeah. did not happen in this case. The developers brought the projects forward and the community shut it down. So I stood with the community in Sunset Park and I shut it down as well. M Mr. Jones, you've been on, on a community board and you know that um, the, the default answer in many cases is no when it comes to uh, community development. There are those who looking at the industry city rezoning uh, proposal saw that as much of what you often see from community boards. If you're the borough president, would you want to revisit what the community board already voted on in Industry City? Community, as we, as uh, uh, Councilman Reynoso said, it made it very clear that we have, if, if once becoming the borough president, we are the voice and the chair leader for the people. So if the people, if we put people on the community boards, then we're putting people with experience, people that we trust. And if the community board says no, when I remember when I was on community board three, when the community board said no, no means no, it didn't happen. And if you are an elected official right now and you're sitting on, you had a situation where you had the opportunity to vote it down and your community board said no, and you still voted for it. So what in the world will a person like that or groups of people do if they're elected as bold president? Are they going to uh, 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 is the community board's vote going to go on deaf ears? So as the borough president of Brooklyn, I'm a cheerleader. I'm an advocator for the community. And whatever the community wants, that's what the borough president should want. So I vote with the people. If the people say no, we say no. The other thing we have to take a look at is a lot of times people talk about jobs. How many projects have come up all throughout Brooklyn where they talked about jobs and the community didn't get jobs? Let's take a look at some of the people who have done fundraisers and are raising all this enormous uh, uh, amount of money. Well, $1,000? Who has $1,000 in a pandemic, for God's sake? I mean, really? Got so it, it. a lot it. of those developers are sneaking in behind closed doors, giving money. And that's why people got all this money. Let me, let, let me move on, Ms. Simon. I know it was the uh, industry city itself. is The site is not in your district, but it's adjacent to it or nearby. Uh, what was your take on the, the proposal? And if elected borough president, would you revisit it? Hear me. She there? Excuse me, I, un I muted myself because I was coughing there before. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, here's the question. Uh, it, I think development needs to start at community. ULERP is top-down developer-driven as people have talked about. And I think we need a community, comprehensive community planning vision for the borough. Um, if the community wanted to look at Industry City, and I point out that Industry City was doing very, very well for itself without a rezoning. The reality is they didn't need rezoning to make money. They are still continuing to work it there. Uh, not unlike Atlantic Yards, which was not Euler, but the reality is that area was coming back without the help of the government. With the help of the government, we now have a hole in the ground and not even a quarter of the housing that was planned. So the reality is that we need to look at, at, uh, at all of these things with a fresh eye and look at it from a community base. When the community clearly came out against the industry, industry city proposal. And the reason they did that is, it is about climate. It is about a just transition. And that proposal did not provide for a just transition. It did not provide for the environmental sustainability that is so desperately needed by the community. Thank you. Okay, Mr. McFadder, what did you think of industry city? You're on mute, mute. Jean Duke. Unmute your. Uh... Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I'm definitely going to concur with Jones and Reynoso around the, the community. Uh, but I do want to say that I'm confused because so many people have been in these conversations before this race. And I haven't seen anybody that stood to the front and, and really shown that this is a major issue to our community, to our community members. So I think that right now, what we really need to focus on is one, these private hearings, right? You got an opportunity to have public and private hearings and the community don't know the difference. They're not given an opportunity 
to be in these hearings to really make the determination. We're talking about a small percentage of people, community members who are voting on these boards, right? Or who are at these uh, participatory budget meetings or zoning meetings. And we have to make it to where it is transparent to everybody, right? Every step of the way, our community has to have the ability to see and vote on that. And that's what I'm looking at doing as bubble president, making sure that there were no, lo no longer, nothing is no longer private to our community. Uh, we, get the, we get the vote from everybody from the sure. time conversation. Ms. Council. Um, I Listen, if the community says no, then the answer is no. And there's no one size fits all um, for these types of things. It has to be community driven. Um, I mean, like we see time and time again where developers come in and they have a plan and they have not had a conversation with the community. They haven't thought about the impact that it's going to have on the community. I remember when we were doing a sustainable East New York uh, project over here a couple of years ago, where we were talking about, you know, they were talking about how high it needed to be and up zoning and things of that nature. We're like, how affordable is it going to be? How is it going to impact in NYPD? How is it going to impact the fire department? How is it going to impact the schools? How is it going to impact the transit? So these are the types of things that we need to have conversations with and why community input is very important from the very beginning. So even when developers come to my office when I'm the borough president and they want to have a project, if they have not included people in the community and not just the community board, but the people in the community and their planning, the answer is going to be no. Okay, and Mr. Edwards, let me let me push back about uh, against the uh, prevailing conventional wisdom here in our last minute. Um, I work at night. I'm never going to a community board meeting. They never have meetings that I can attend, and that's that. Um, I've been here for 30 years. Somebody moves into the neighborhood across the street, say from Industry City, they've been living there for five minutes, right? Literally six months. They get on the community board. Why should they have more say about this project than me? Well, I mean, I think that's the bigger issue, right? Because they shouldn't. And I think part of what we were talking about reforming the community boards is to really get a screening process where they, we can create those kind of conversations <laughs> because you do work at night, but yet you have something to say about your community. We have to reach you where you are. I mean, when, when we started to do flu shots, when we were doing census, we were up middle of the night going to everybody where they worked and creating those relationships. And I don't think that, I mean, Rob gave them credit for how hard they work. I think these screening committees in the, in the borough president's office should create these kind of uh, pathways of communication and access so that everybody's included. I mean, let's take it East, the East New York um, rezoning, right? Which to me was a, a bigger travesty than, than the um, industry city. You still have 3,600 jobs, people are waiting for those jobs in a community whose median income is 24,000. So when, when the community said this is, wasn't for us and the mayor's office still pushed through, I think what the borough president's office needs to do is to be its own city hall at that point where we have all of these resources in one building so that we by the time we get to the mayor's choice or the city council's choice that we already have a cohesive plan. So to that point, yes, access and communication, getting the people where they are, especially those seniors and those people who've been living in this community for many years, who have a right to have that choice in there. So I would have voted no with, with my other colleagues on that as well. Okay, that brings us to the end of our time. Uh, I wanna thank all of the candidates for participating. We're gonna wish you uh, the best of luck. Petitions hit the street in just a few weeks. And one of the purposes of this conversation was to allow the Brooklyn uh, district leaders to see who they might want to carry on their petition. So uh, we'll, we'll see you out there. Uh, however this goes down, I know there's a lot of questions about how to do this in a pandemic. We'll leave those conversations for another time and uh, say good night for now. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Thank you. Thank you Appreciate very much. It. So we leave this. Or just keep rolling. What are we doing? Waiting. Hold on. Quick question: How do we watch the the next one? Do we go on offline? Yes, we we will we we'll, we will transition you to attendee. We're doing it right now. You Thank can you. stay on. Thank you.
I hope you enjoyed the debate for Brooklyn Borough President. My name is Assembly Member Rodney B. Short. I am oh, Rodney B. Short Hermlin. <laughs> I am the Brooklyn Democratic Party Chair, and it's a pleasure to uh, be part of hosting this debate tonight in Brooklyn, the very first debate. The candidates of the Brooklyn Borough President uh, truly showcase their diverse views that will propel our borough forward. The beauty of Brooklyn's democracy is that there's a mosaic of different viewpoints, but everyone wants to help the borough recover and strengthen. I'd like to once again thank all the candidates and to thank you for watching. Please keep the candidates' informative discussions and debates in mind when you vote in our next BP election. Now you'll hear from controller candidates, Senator Brian Benjamin, Senator Kevin Parker, Assemblymember David Weprin, Councilmember Brad Lander, and Reshma Patel. The controller serving as the Chief Financial Officer for New York City will play a vital role in the economic recovery of our city and borough. I can't stress how important this election is for the city's bounce back. Let's give them a round, a virtual round of applause and get started. Again, I am really excited that we have Brooklyn moderator, Errol Lewis, who is facilitating this debate. We want everybody to know that we have reached capacity on Zoom. We are streaming live at the BK Dems YouTube, as well as BK Dems Facebook page. All chats will only be enabled on YouTube and Facebook. Please join me once again in welcoming our Brooklyn moderator this evening, Errol Lewis. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I want to uh, start with a brief rundown of what the city controller does. The city controller is the chief financial officer of city government, a watchdog charged with keeping an eye on spending by the mayor and the city council. The controller audits city agencies. It looks for waste, fraud, or mismanagement on everything from homeless policy to the school system. Besides overseeing the city's 90 plus billion dollar budget, the controller manages money, a lot of it in fact, running a number of funds, including the city's massive pension holdings. The hell? It shows us that controllers often find themselves either clashing with the mayor or at some point hoping to take over the role for him or herself. Please turn. Uh, I can't start my video. Um, okay, we'll, we'll uh, let that, uh, we'll let the tech people uh, deal with that. Uh, seven of the previous eight controllers have run for mayor, just wanted to mention that. So uh, picking a controller is also very likely picking a future candidate for mayor. Uh, as you heard, the candidates we're gonna hear from tonight are State Senator Brian Benjamin, City Councilman Brad Lander, Assemblyman David Weprin, State Senator Kevin Parker, and we have uh, Reshma Patel, the president of the Eleanor Roosevelt Democratic Club, also with us here tonight. They all hope to be uh, candidates and to make the ballot when petitions hit the street next month. Um, and uh, let me, uh, Briefly run down the rules for this discussion. We're not gonna have opening statements, but candidates will generally have 45 seconds to respond to my questions. We may have follow-up questions for clarity. Um, and then uh, rebuttals to questions are limited to 30 seconds. If somebody 
really feels like they have to jump in after and, and answer. Um, but uh, generally, we're going to try and reserve that back and forth for the cross-examination round in which each candidate will be allowed to ask one question to one of his or her rivals and get a one minute response. Um, we're gonna get all candidates in on the discussion of each major subject area. The goal here, of course, is a substantive discussion of how these candidates will tackle the important issues facing New York. So um, my first question, there is gonna be a, a sea of red ink waiting for the next controller. Uh, budget deficit estimates have run as high as $9 billion. Uh, there's no guarantee that that will be solved. In fact, it's most likely that it will not be resolved by the time the next controller is sworn in. Uh, where do you think the city should look to find savings? Let's begin with you, Mr. Benjamin. Thank you so much for that question, Aaron. And I want to thank my, uh, my colleagues for being here as well. So just to start with your question, I think, number one, that we need to look to the federal government uh, we just was fortunate enough to have uh, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris win, as well as uh, taking control of the Senate. And so we believe, I'm chair of the Budget and Revenues Con Committee in the Senate, we believe that there will be some resources that will come from the federal government uh, and will be to be of support. Uh, but in, in regards to your question about where the savings should come from, I think we have to look at a couple places. When we look at the education budget, we have to look at the uh, social services budget, and we also have to look at uh, NYCHA. There are a number of uh, issues that I believe are of importance uh, that, we can, that we can really figure out. And I will add to that, the NYPD's budget needs to be uh, audited and looked at very closely as well, because I believe that there's some money there that should be reallocated to other places. So I think when you, uh, uh, the next control can do that. Okay, Mr. Lander. Thank you very much, Errol. It's great to be here. Um, look, the city faces a really severe challenge, $10.5 billion over three years. This year, we saw a $2.5 billion dip in property taxes. Um, uh, Senator Benjamin is right that we need to look to Washington and Albany, uh, but I think he's wrong that we should cut education, social services, or NYCHA, I guess the areas that I want to protect the social safety net and our schools. I think we should be looking at the 421A tax break program where it's spending $1.5 billion a year. We just learned last week that 1,500 landlords are cheating in that program. Uh, I agree we should look at the NYPD. Um, uh, and I think we should look at how we save money on capital projects. Uh, the capital budget's about $10 billion. More than half the projects are over budget and behind on time. That's one more place we can find savings. Okay, Mr. Weprin. Is he there? Unmute. Uh, Miss, you have to unmute, Mr. Weprin. You're muted right now. There you go. I'd like to thank the Brooklyn Democrats, uh, my colleague in the assembly, uh, Rodney's uh, Bichot, uh, as well as uh, Errol Lewis for moderating uh, this important debate tonight. Um, I think we can save a lot of money in the budget and uh, I have the relevant finance experience, public and private sector uh, to make a difference. But the uh, first place I would be looking to save money uh, is in the outside contracting budget uh, of the city of New York. The outside contracting budget is about $17 billion out of a $92 billion uh, New York City budget, uh, over 19%. Uh, so I think uh, if we look at that outside contracting budget, there's a lot of savings uh, that can be found, uh, particularly in the Department of Education, where that uh, outside contracting budget alone uh, is about $8 billion. And uh, that money uh, could be used to provide more uh, services to the classroom, to hire more teachers. But uh, certainly that is one place where I think we can save money through the audit function. Okay, Ms. Patel. Thank you, Errol. Um, it's truly a pleasure to uh, you know, be here with you and thank you to Brooklyn Democrats. Um, so I agree with you know, uh, what, my fellow candidates have said um, with the contracts with David mentioned and as well as uh, the NYPD budget and getting funds from DC. I would add that one of the largest line items in the budget, you know, $6.4 billion this year is debt service on the outstanding bonds. And we can look at refinancing of this debt 
we have historically low interest rates, so we can generate savings. Nearly, you know, a billion dollars of savings could be generated by refinancing of debt, and we need to push uh, DC to change the tax law in 2017, which took away our ability to refund debt on a tax exempt basis. And if we get that ability back, we would be able to lower the cost of borrowing even more. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Mr. Parker. Thank you, Errol. Uh, again, I'm State Senator Kevin Parker. I'm the chairman of the Energy and Telecommunications Committee, as well as the majority whip in the New York State Senate. Uh, let me say thank you to uh, Madam Leader uh, Rodney Pashat, and certainly great to see you again, Errol. Uh, you know, I think that my colleagues have given great answers, um, but, you know, and we're going to need to get help from the federal government and we're going to need to do some some work around making sure that ultra millionaires in this city and state um, pay their fair share. But we're not going to tax our way and we're not going to cut our way out of this. We're only going to be able to build our way out of this. We got to create full time jobs at a living wage with benefits. We have to put people back to work. New Yorkers do not want a hand out. They want a hand up. And so I have experience after 18 years of being on the finance committee of closing multi-billion dollar deficits. I can certainly do it again here on a much smaller budget uh, here in the city of New York. Um, and, you know, and, it, and it can be in fact done without major, making major cuts to, th to, to things that are important to our community like education or you know, affordable housing like NYCHA. Um, and, but, we, but we certainly need to kind of concentrate really on putting people back to work and creating more revenue, not cutting things out of people's lives. Mm. Okay, candidates. Um, we didn't have opening statements, but um, this uh, position, unlike some others, uh, really does have a specialized realm of expertise. And I know um, you all are coming from very different places as far as where you've been professionally uh, over the last 20, 30 years. Um, take a minute to explain what part of your uh, background, professional background, uh, best equipped you to be the next controller of New York? And let's go in reverse alphabetical order. We'll start with you, Mr. Weprin. Well, first of all, um, I'm the only one uh, that has the relevant uh, finance experience in both the public and private sector. Uh, I chaired the finance committee of the city council uh, in 2002 through 2009. I came in uh, right after uh, the fiscal crisis resulting from 9-11. We had a multi-billion dollar deficit. Uh, we turned that uh, into a surplus. Uh, I was a major part uh, of that turnaround, uh, as well as um, private sector finance experience. I was on Wall Street uh, for 25 years uh, with major firms in municipal finance, uh, very relevant to the function of the debt issuance uh, and uh, refinancing bonds and, and working on, on bond issues. Uh, I also, um, have been on uh, the Ways and Means Committee uh, in Albany and uh, have been uh, involved in very progressive legislation, uh, both um, at, at many different levels, criminal justice reform, uh, as well as a major piece of the legislation like the Adoptee Bill of Rights and the Religious Guard Bill. But uh, I think I most particularly have the relevant finance experience in the, both the public and private sector. Okay, um, Ms. Patel. Um, so I actually, like David, have worked in public finance. I have over 18 years of experience in public finance. And of eight of those, I was the financial advisor to the city comptroller's office and worked with the office in and out every day. Um, so really know the nuts and bolts of the office. And, um, you know, most people in public finance would tell you that I'm one of the few experts who knows how to structure and refinance New York City debt, which is unique compared to any other municipality in the country. To say the least, yes. yes. Uh, Mr. Mr. Parker. Thank you, Errol. Um, my whole uh, career, professional career, really has been culminating to this moment. Um, I've spent my whole life working in economic development and, and finance in one way or another, having worked for the first uh, Governor Cuomo in the Urban Development Corporation, what is now the Empire State Development Corporation, having worked on Wall Street and Payne Weber for the chairman of Payne Weber, and then having worked for the state controller for a number of years. But I've spent you know, probably the most relevant thing is having spent 18 years in the New York State Senate, where I have been on the finance committee that entire time, with over a decade also on the on the banking committee and over a decade on the insurance committee. And it's those understandings of not just how you deal with debt and, and, and deal with um, the issues of finance, but more importantly, how do you understand budgets as value documents? The reality is not about can you make the numbers work, the question is can you make the city work? And that's what I've been an expert at on the state level and certainly want to bring that skills and experience uh, to the city. Okay, Mr. Lander. 
Thanks very much, Errol. Uh, I have not been a Wall Street investment banker or a for-profit private developer. Uh, before I got into government, I spent 15 years running two nonprofit organizations, the Fifth Avenue Committee and the Pratt Center, community development and affordable housing, had to make payroll every two weeks, oversaw audits every year. And for the past 10 years, I've served in the council where I've made sure we balance the budget in sync with our values, done oversight of every single city agency, um, and written new rules to make sure that fast food workers, car washeros, freelancers, Uber and Lyft drivers, and many more folks could benefit more from our city's economy. There's a reason we don't hire someone from Wall Street for this job, but instead elected. What we want is someone who shares the vision and value of New Yorkers, who knows the city budget inside and out, uh, and who has the chops to make government work better, make those city agencies work better so that we can get there. Okay. Mr. Benjamin. Thank you for the question, Earl. Uh, you know, one of the things that is ch challenging the next city comptroller is gonna be the fact that we have a $230 billion pension fund that right now, as of last year, the city had to provide $10 million of the city's budget that can otherwise be going to hospitals, uh, schools, all kinds of other initiatives have to be provided to the city pension fund. And because the city pension fund returned less than the 7% hurdle rate this past year, that number is going up. I'm the only candidate who's running in this race who has investment management experience who can come on day one and be a real chief investment officer of the $230 billion portfolio to help bring those returns up so that the city doesn't have to provide ever more important dollars to that, to that end. And I do believe that someone with a finance background is a relevant role when you're trying to be the chief financial officer of the city. And I think that uh, when you're talking about the pension fund, we have to be very careful about making sure that, 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 that those dollars are maximized for the retirees benefit, but also to help make sure the city of New York doesn't have to put more money in. And there's some of us who have that experience and some of us who don't. Okay. Um, let's go to our uh, cross-examination round. This is a chance for each candidate to ask uh, one of his or her rivals a question and to get a uh, one minute response. And that's, that's the whole thing. It's not intended to start a back and forth, but just to kind of see what's on the minds of the candidates and allow candidates to uh, direct a question to one, one person and, and get a brief response. Let's start with you, Mr. Benjamin. My question is for Council Member Lander. Uh, council member, over the last 10 years, you've been a city council member. And uh, during that same time, the police budget has grown by over a third. Uh, matter of fact, every year you have voted on those budgets. And now you, this last budget, you voted against it. But I guess my question for you is, over the last 10 years, were you investigating the police budget? Didn't you see an issue with continuing continue to raise uh, the police budget year over year over year. And, you know, for someone who cares about criminal justice reform, cares about police reform, I passed the Eric Garner anti chokehold Act. Uh, how are you thinking about those decisions you were making when you were uh, passing the police budgets year over year? Thanks for that question, Senator Benjamin. So I've worked very hard on police oversight and police reform. In 2013, I teamed up with public advocate, then council member Jumani Williams to pass the Community Safety Act that uh, helped end discriminatory stop and frisk by banning uh, uh, racial profiling by the NYPD. And more importantly, it created the office of the NYPD Inspector General, uh, which has then done investigations on use of force, on money that we're spending on surveillance technology. Uh, and I've done follow-up oversight and hearings on all of those uh, investigations and audits. Um, and you're right, this past year, I made a real clear uh, set of principles. I was the first elected official to come out and say, if we have to have a hiring freeze on teachers as a result of the pandemic, uh, we ought to have a hiring freeze on police officers as well. Um, and when we didn't get that, when advocates called for a $1 billion cut to the NYPD budget, uh, I made clear that I wouldn't support a budget unless it made those cuts. Uh, and I stood by my word. I was one of the few members who voted no on the budget because it did not cut the NYPD by a billion dollars. That is a place where we need to keep people safe, but we can do it with less policing. Um, and I put out a plan to do that on traffic safety. Uh, I think we can do that around violence interruption, around mental health response, around domestic violence response. We can keep people safe while spending less on policing. Okay. Your turn to ask a question, Mr. Lander. Uh, thank you, Errol. All right, Mr. Uh, Senator Benjamin, I'll ask one back to of course, you. Why not? Um, <laughs> uh, and I'll stick on the topic of the NYPD, actually. Um, I've heard you say, you know, on uh, some of these forums in the past that the first thing you'll do when you get there is audit the NYPD. I've heard you say, yes. 
no one knows how much we're spending. Maybe it's five billion, maybe it's 11 billion. Um, but you know, the numbers are there in the budget. It shouldn't take an audit to find them out. And advocates have been calling for very specific changes. So shouldn't New Yorkers uh, get a controller who already knows what's in the NYPD budget and who's clear and upfront with people about where they think the change should be? Thank you for the question, Brad. First of all, uh, when I was talking about the difference between the, the 6 billion and 11 billion, I was talking about the fact that there are pension obligations that people include in the numbers. And so I am very aware of what the numbers are what I was saying was that when la last year, when, when the city council, which you were part of, was making a decision about whether they should defund the police or not defund the police, none of the conversation was about the actual facts of the matter. It was about a billion dollars and it was about tweets and texts. And, I, and my view is as the comptroller, my job is to be the referee of this conversation and to provide transparency and accountability around these numbers. So I'm very clear what the numbers are all I'm asking is that as the city is making very important decisions going forward, community policing is a real issue. Uh, the fact that some of this, the, the, the Department of uh, NYPD's budget is still tied to money from the Giuliani days, we need, to, we need to lay all that out transparently to the public and let them know where the money should be trimmed and where it should be reallocated to. And so I look forward to being that person, but to be very clear, I know where the money is. I was making a, a particular comment about the pension obligations and how you include or not include that in the cost of the NYPD. Thanks for the question. Thank you. Mr. Parker. Yes. <clears throat> I'd like to ask a question to my good friend, uh, Assemblyman David Weprin. Um, David, uh, as we you know, get through this pandemic and we're fighting for both our lives and our livelihoods, how would you put New Yorkers back to work, particularly those in African-American and Latino communities who have been suffering from labor market discrimination? Well, we, uh, we have to uh, bring back the economy. Um, we have to do a lot of different things. We all have to uh, get together uh, and bring all the, uh, the fiscal experts uh, together. But uh, uh, immediately, we have to make sure that the uh, vaccine is equitably distributed uh, across the city. And we, uh, we get to herd immunity as quickly as possible. Uh, I am optimistic uh, with President Biden and uh, Senate Majority Leader, our own Chuck Schumer, uh, that will get uh, the vaccines we need and get them out to everyone uh, to get to herd immunity. Uh, we have to uh, get there in order to really totally bring back uh, the business community and, and small businesses. Uh, but I think um, we, we, there's a lot we can do uh, as far as um, you know, bringing the businesses back and uh, creating new revenue stream. Uh, I've proposed uh, creating new taxes uh, similar. I, I actually proposed it in July in an op-ed piece to, uh, to have um, online betting uh, tax in New York. We're losing a lot of revenue to New Jersey, as well as a marijuana tax that New York City and New York State can benefit from. So there's a lot we can do uh, to bring back the economy, uh, but I think we, uh, we have to start with uh, getting businesses back to work. Okay, thank you. Ms. Patel, you can ask a question. Sure, I'm gonna ask a question of uh, Mr. Weprin as well. Uh, David, it's great to see someone else who has had public finance experience, which is a core function of the Comptroller's Office, but I think a function that gets overlooked. But my question to you is about, I've served as a co-chair of Chaya Community Development Corporation Board, and you know, you know, your assembly district covers some of the areas served by Chaya, and many of the immigrant businesses that we work with have not gotten support from the state level. And how do you suppose that we can address this issue and what would you do differently as controller to see how we help these immigrant small businesses in neighborhoods that have been most impacted by this COVID-19 crisis? Oh, absolutely. Um, we need more uh, to uh, affect our uh, diverse communities and, and bring them uh, into the process. Uh, certainly um, on the investment front, I think it's important that we have uh, a more diverse uh, group of managers uh, and financial advisors and underwriters. And I certainly would outreach to uh, the various uh, communities uh, in, in our city. I'm very proud that I have such a diverse assembly district. Uh, about 60% of my assembly district constituents are first generation born in other countries. And I think we have to recognize the diversity in the city. Uh, and I would certainly make that a priority uh, as controller. Okay. And uh, Mr. Weprin, you can ask a question as well. Okay, uh, I'm gonna ask a question of Councilman Lander, uh, also on the uh, police budget. Uh, you, uh, you were very proud about uh, 
voting against the city budget because it didn't cut the police department uh, enough uh, and reduce uh, police headcount. Uh, I'm a little concerned uh, with hate crimes rising throughout New York City uh, that by cutting uh, the police headcount and the police budget, that there won't be a priority uh, in trying to investigate hate crimes, which is uh, a very big problem throughout the city. Uh, how would you deal with that, uh, Councilman Lander? Uh, thanks very much, Assemblymember. And you know, hate crimes is an issue uh, that I care deeply about. I think you and I were out there together just about a year ago right now at the big march against anti-Semitism when we marched over the Brooklyn Bridge. Um, I think hate crimes is actually an area where non-police response is essential. So I supported the new office that has been created for <laughs> hate crimes prevention, uh, as well as resources to the city's Commission on Human Rights to do outreach in partnership with community-based organizations. I actually went out, uh, I represent both Kensington, largely Muslim community, and Borough Park, a piece of it, which is largely Orthodox Jewish community. And we went out there with a set of Yiddish speakers and uh, Bangla speakers and Urdu speakers to engage in community outreach. And I actually had reported to me um, uh, a hate crime where one of the rabbis from one of the yeshivas said, uh, kids from that local school came and like threw eggs and stink bombs on the bus. And I was out there with the Commission on Human Rights and we were able to get a process going that got some education in that public school. So obviously when there is a violent crime, you need to have police out there to investigate. But if we wanna to get to the root of hate crimes, then we've gotta do much deeper education and outreach work in our communities. I think it's a great example where responses other than policing are what will get us to the city that we want. We want a city that's safe for everyone um, and we're not gonna get there just by sending police officers. Okay. Thank you, candidates. Uh, I want to ask uh, a, a, a public safety related question. Mayor de Blasio, of course, has announced a plan to close the Rikers Island jail complex over the next 10 years. Uh, the next uh, mayor and council and controller will have to deal with this plan, uh, which is to replace Rikers with smaller borough based facilities across the city at an estimated cost of more than $10 billion. Uh, do you support the plan? If you oppose the plan, what alternatives would you propose? And let's start with you, Mr. Benjamin. Thank you for the question, Errol. When I first joined the Senate, my first bill was to uh, introduce, was introduced to close Rikers Island in, in less than five years. And so for me, I'm completely in support of closing Rikers for smaller borough-based jails. I think that not only is it more humane, it's, it's, um, it's cheaper. And the amount of uh, money we are spending when people are traveling to see their loved ones, it's very um, uh, expensive. It's really a, a, a whole day affair. We need to make uh, access more uh, easier for, for individuals. And also when some folks are incarcerated, they should be near uh, the courts. And I think we should, we should move in that direction. And I'm a, I'm a big supporter of, of a closing records as soon as possible. Okay, Mr. Lander, I know you voted um, for, for the closure. Uh, do you like the plan as it finally came out? If, if you're elected controller, would you suggest any changes to it? I do support the plan. I was one of the first elected officials to join Just Leadership USA's call to close Rikers and marched with them on the march that helped win it. Um, I voted for it last summer on one of the hottest days. I actually toured the Brooklyn House of Detention. You would not have wanted to have anyone you loved, any family member in there. It was brutally hot. It has to be torn down. Um, we can't afford this. Actually, there's some room. Capital budget investments help create jobs. Um, and right now, the budget we're spending for affordable housing, for infrastructure, for economic development, and for uh, the borough-based jails, uh, is it about 11% of the city budget? You want to keep it below 15%, but we have room for the kind of long-term investments that make our city uh, safer and that make it more equal. Um, I do like that the numbers have come down. When that plan started, it would have created 5,500 uh, uh, cells. Um, the, it came down thanks to advocacy for 3,500. We want to incarcerate as few people as we as possible while they're awaiting their fair day in court. Um, COVID made us push that hard. I think we should continue to try to see what we can do to push it even harder. Now, Mr. Parker, you've heard, I'm sure, from community advocates who say, what kind of a use is this for, you know, 10 odd billion dollars? We're not building schools, we're building jails instead. What, what would you say to people who have that objection? 
Well, I, I object to the plan. I don't think that closing Rikers in the way that is this, that they have currently uh, conceived it is the, is the right way to do it. Um, certainly also, um, you know, the, the question of citing all these, you know, new facilities and communities that don't want the facilities is also a major, major problem. And I hear my colleagues talking about um, closing facilities without even a understanding of what's going to happen in communities, but then also how do you, in fact, reduce the population? I'm the only one here who has a bill that actually creates an emergency um, mental health unit, right? That creates a, uh, that creates a real non-police response to mental health and homeless calls, right? So it's one thing that is cute to talk about it, but I've actually drafted the legislation. Just like when we did the whole package in, in Albany, I wrote four of the 10 bills that the state legislature actually um, passed, including the 911 um, um, false reporting bill and a bill that requires state police uh, to wear body cameras. And so it's that kind of innovation I think that we need to do. We need to significantly um, reduce the population of Rikers, and I agree with, with that. We also need to, to overhaul um, the, the facility. It's a horrible facility, and we, and we can fix it. Um, but you don't have to close it and open up other facilities in communities that may be more dangerous for those community members. And and at a time when we have very little money, why would we spend money in jails instead of investing in, in places that we actually need? Ms. Um I have advocated for the closing of Rikers as a local leader and a community board member. I think that it is unfair to have family members travel so far. And I think the conditions on Rikers, I've gone there to do some civics education work and it's just a horrible place. And I think uh, having the prisons closer to courts makes it easier. And what we really need to focus on is how do we reduce our prison population, right? How do we find people instead of sending them to prison for minor incidences? And how do we have programs for youth that keep them busy after school so they don't end up in our prisons? And we should have community buy-in too. I mean, we should have discussions on where these prisons should be um, because we, there have been a lot of community protests and that is something that we need to take into consideration. But I don't think the solution is to keep Rikers open. Well, let me, let me ask you, um, uh, when it comes to Queens, uh, Ms. Patel, uh, the, the plan would require the, uh, the demolition and basically quite complete rebuilding of the Queens House of Detention in Kew Gardens. Uh, if local communities didn't want that, but it still met one of the requirements that you just laid out, meaning it's essentially adjacent to the courts, uh, what would you say to that community? So, I, so first of all, I actually don't live in Queens. I've just happened to serve on the board of a community development corporation in Queens. I'm in Manhattan, just to clarify that, but I, Queens is near and dear to my heart because of the work I've done there. And um, I would try to work with the community leaders and find out you know, what we can do to make a space for this prison because we really need a discussion to make them understand the need of those who are being kept in the jails and how they need to be close to the courthouse and need to have their families nearby if we're going to be able to rehabilitate people and it's longer term public safety it helps us. Mm -hmm. Mr. Weprin. Yeah as chair of the corrections committee I was consulted um, about closing Rikers. I supported closing Rikers. Uh, the population has gone down significantly uh, to uh, bail reform. Um, as you know um, in, inmates at Rikers Island, incarcerated individuals at Rikers Island are mostly pre-trial and have not been convicted of anything. Uh, and uh, that's why uh, it's good that they're reducing that population because uh, until uh, people have a, have a trial and are, uh, are convicted of anything, uh, there's, there's no need to have them uh, there. And part of the problem was people that couldn't make cash bail, uh, very often uh, small amounts of money, but there were a lot of uh, poor individuals uh, whose families cannot afford the, the bail. So that has been reduced. Uh, I would support more consultation with various communities about siting. Uh, you know, I'm not necessarily convinced that, that these particular sites uh, that do have some community opposition are the right sites, but I think uh, the population uh, of incarcerated individuals on those local jails will be reduced uh, due to the um, reduction of the uh, prison population overall. Uh, and the local jails uh, who were mostly pre-trial or uh, people that were sentenced to a, a year or less uh, are often incarcerated in local jails. Okay. Um, folks, I wanna talk a, a little bit about uh, the controller's role in leading the pension funds that retired city employees rely on. I'd like to know from each of you if you would propose any changes to the way that investments are selected or monitored. For example, would you put more into index funds 
as opposed to other investments. Let's uh, let's start with you, Mr. Weprin. Well, my uh, first of all, let me say that um, my 90 year old mother, uh, who is a, a Cuban Jewish immigrant uh, to this country, came here, didn't speak a word of English, uh, went to public schools, became a teacher and a proud UFT member. She has a pension that she's concerned about uh, that, that she's been using. And uh, she's been asking me uh, about that. Uh, you know, there's no question uh, that the key on uh, pension funds uh, are diversification, and we should be exploring uh, various uh, entities uh, and expanding some of the private equity funds and hedge funds so uh, we don't have a, a situation like, uh, you know, the recent uh, trading uh, situation where uh, a lot of the hedge funds and, and private equity funds uh, do the game stock uh, issue. Uh, were hurt, and we have some, you know, potential, some investments uh, in the city pension fund. So I think the key is diversification, uh, to add more funds uh, and to uh, diversify uh, on the portfolios. Uh, Mr. Lander, talk about your uh, in investment philosophy if you're elected controller. Absolutely. Thank you. The, the comptroller's role as a fiduciary to the five pension funds is really a sacred one, making sure that our firefighters and teachers and nurses and secretaries have the retirement security that they were promised. My mom was a lifelong public school teacher, relies on that pension. Um, the most core principle, uh, in addition to diversification, is to take the long-term view on achieving risk-adjusted market rate returns. Um, and I think that does mean asking some hard questions. I don't think the answer is looking at more private equity or hedge funds. It actually does seem to me that the situation with GameStop and Sylvester Capital shows that we probably should be looking at reducing our exposure in private equity and hedge funds, which aim for short-term gains. We want the kind of investments that are gonna provide long-term durable security um, one proposal that I'm making is to do uh, a strategic plan for responsible investing. Um, I do support divestment from fossil fuels as proposed by Controller Stringer. I think there's more we can do to make sure that our investments are investing in clean and renewable energy um, and that where we own a lot of companies, banks, utilities, uh, tech companies, that we're using shareholder activism to put pressure on them to do more to reduce their carbon footprint. But rather than do that sporadically or reactively, every two years, we should do a strategic plan for responsible investing that brings together both those long-term investment philosophies with the values of the folks whose money it is so that we can make those decisions proactively aligned with other investors, public sector and private sector, guarantee the retirement security of those public sector workers, but do it in a way that's also in sync with their values and their future. Okay. Ms. Patel, how would you uh, run the investment side of the office? Sure. So like everyone else, I also had a mother who had a union job, not in New York City, so not, a, you know, one of the city pensioners, but um, it's something that I care about. And I think it's important to protect these pensions. Um, you know, the, I, I agree with diversification. And I think that we should also be looking at investing in businesses that are going to help rebuild New York City. And looking at, um, you know, if you look at the California pension funds, this year, they're private equity side and hedge fund side actually went down by 5%, but their investments in uh, small businesses and startups was up by 11%. And, you know, we have to monitor that risk properly because, you know, uh, it is a, perhaps a more risk, uh, but we should be investing in companies, you know, New York City has had in the last five years, almost 50 billion of exits from startups. And we could be benefiting from the amount of uh, startup capital that's been coming into this city. So that's one thing. And then, you know, study after study shows that more diverse companies are more profitable. And we really need to, you know, a control stringer has done a great job with board accountability and requiring that we invest in companies that have women and people of color um, on their boards. And we need to just push that further and make sure that, you know, we have that kind of diversity. And in addition to just you know, divesting from fossil fuels, we need to look at the companies that we're investing in and to make sure they're ready for a new economy because we are moving towards clean energy. And you know, this is something that the Norwegian Pension Fund has been making sure that every company they invest in is going to be one that can survive the new economy that's going to happen, because it's a long-term investment for us. OK, uh, Mr. Parker. Thank you, Errol. My investment philosophy that is that if it doesn't make dollars, it doesn't make sense, right? So the main job for those of us who are going to be um, overseeing the pension fund is to work in a collaborative way with the other trustees to make sure that 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 money is made um, for those pensioners, but then simultaneously make sure that that the pension funds reflect the the values 
and the outlook of New Yorkers and particularly pensioners. I had two parents who were pensioners. My father worked for transit. My mother worked for uh, a DC 37 union. And so I know how important this is in terms of um, building generational wealth, um, particularly in black and Latino communities, right? Um, and, but as we talk about diversity, we need to start talking about diversity in the context of who manages our money. So one of the first things I do is make sure that Blacks, Latinos, Asians, and women are actually more of the money managers, which right now they are very, 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 very few. And that, create, and that creates a, a significant inequity. Um, in addition to that, we need to invest in funds that invest in New York City businesses. Again, we're not going to tax our way or cut our way out of this crisis. We're going to need to build our way out. And we're only going to build our way out in an economy that's moving from Wall Street to Main Street by investing in small buildings, uh, businesses, sorry, providing um, you know, access to capital and technical assistance to these businesses so they can hire people. And so that's how we need to use the pension fund. And that's certainly how I'll be looking at it and trying to make investment um, okay. decisions. Mr. Mr. Benjamin. Thank you for the question, Earl. First, uh, we need to increase the economically tar targeted investments that are within the fund. And so I agree with the diversification point that David made. Uh, and so I think that what we need to focus on is some of the strategic goals of the New York City that have not been resolved. Number one, affordable housing. We need a strategic plan from City Hall that is funded and facilitated through some very important uh, targeted investments that the Comptroller's Office can make. I used to build affordable housing. There are decent returns in affordable housing. The city should be getting that so that you are not only protecting the retirees of today, you're also helping the future generations with affordable housing. Second, we need to look at permanent supportive housing. Right now, we're spending way too much money, Earl, on temporary uh, shelters, over 6,000 for a family, over 3,000 uh, for, for an individual. We can acquire some of the hotels that are in, that are in rough shape in a, in a targeted and important way and provide working with permanent supportive housing operators, real permanent supportive housing for our, our citizens. And lastly, I wanna talk about uh, the investments from fossil fuels. You know, I actually sit on the board of Brown University where, I'm, where I'm, I was part of the conversation where we led the efforts within the Ivy League institutions to divest on fossil fuels. And oh, by the way, Brown's returns over the last 10 years, over 12%, last three years, over 12%. So I've been part of a process where we've actually divested from fossil fuels while maintaining strong returns for the pensioners. That's the kind of, I'm sorry, not for pensioners, for the, for the endowment of Brown, that's the kind of leadership and skill set that I can bring to the table to work with the pensioners to make them feel comfortable that yes, we can we can execute our values while at the same time provide great returns for our invest for our, our retirees. Well, well let, let me ask you a, a variation on that question then, Mr. Benjamin. What what if the return goes down? Um, at what point do you, if if there is a tension that um, emerges between the goals of uh, socially responsible investment? and uh, solid return for the pensioners, what would you as controller do about that? Well, I think the, the key is the process, right? And so right now, if you look at the process that has been taking place as it, relate, as it relates to divesting from, from fossil fuels, there has been a very good process, right? The, the, the boards, three of the boards, not, not the police and the fire, three of the boards actually studied the issue, look, have looked at you know, what investments they have in fossil fuels. Uh, and there is a conversation that has taken place around how we move from, the, from that to uh, divestment, full divestment, at least within those three funds. But I believe in order to get the fire and the police on board, they need to feel confident that they're not gonna lose returns for their retirees in order to uh, advance social causes that we believe in. And so for me, I think that, you know, we should have a process that, is, that, that has fail safes in it so that as you are addressing the, the, uh, the divestment, because you don't divest all in one fell swoop, or you divest over time in a way that makes sense. You look at your positions, you figure out where the market is, liquidity, et cetera. So you do that in a way that is responsible. And then um, I think that everything will work itself out through the process. You need to have a process that everyone's, that everyone's invested in, because sometimes a short term um, uh, loss today is really a long term gain. It's just a matter of the of, of what your process is. And so that's how I would I would do it to convince the and let me just say real quick, Errol, the the the, the controller is not the sole shareholder, you are an advisor, a chief investment officer to the five pension boards. So those pension boards have to agree with what you're saying to them. So you just come with a social agenda, but you don't understand the finance and, and how the market piece of it works. 
you're going to fall short. And so that's something that I think needs to be considered. Absolutely. Um, Brad Lander looks like you want to jump in on that. I think it's important here to recognize the controller's got a whole range of tools. You know, climate is a critical issue for the next controller to focus on. The next eight years are the most crucial ones for mitigating climate uh, change and getting our city ready. We've talked a lot about the pension fund strategy. That is critical, but there's a lot else to do. Controller's got a seat on the procurement policy board. We need to move to green procurement. Um, I would set up a sustainability audit team as well as an equity audit team to audit our agencies for energy and waste. We passed a great climate modernization bill in the city council that requires commercial buildings to reduce their carbon footprint, but it needs to be audited or we aren't gonna hit the goals at 2030 and 2050. Um, and we should also be looking at the long-term risks our city is facing. That's part of the job of the controller is to be that long-term risk management officer. We weren't ready for this COVID crisis, but we can be more ready for the next climate crisis. The controller's got a range of tools to do that. And that's what I wanna to put to use. Okay. Now, Ms. Patel, um, I, I just read that um, General Motors has made uh, a pretty bold announcement that they're going to shift to um, all electric powered uh, vehicles uh, in, in a very accelerated time frame. I think like by 2030, 2035 or something like that. Does that make them um, part of the fossil fuel complex to be avoided uh, by, by pension funds? Or does that make them cutting edge into the green economy and something that we uh, should expect the next controller to invest in? I think that makes them cutting edge that they're making that commitment to having all electric vehicles and moving away from having cars. I mean, certain things take a long time, like you know, moving away from having cars that are gas guzzlers and it's mm -hmm. gonna take time to move away. So I don't think we exclude them because they're in an industry which will take longer to get to being completely mm -hmm. uh, a clean energy. Okay, so now David Weprin, what, what do you do if, if uh, you've got this dilemma? There's socially responsible investments that you wanna make, but it doesn't look like the returns are going to uh, work as well as, as a, a more conservative strategy. What do you do? Well, it, it's easy. Your primary responsibility as controller is a fiduciary responsibility uh, to get the best returns on, the, on your assets. And that would be my primary uh, concern. Uh, if you can also do socially responsible investments and you can show uh, that those returns are, are equal, if not superior, uh, for various reasons, then that's a different situation. But you can't forget uh, that your primary responsibility is to get uh, the best returns on the assets. And I will uh, have that as my primary responsibility. Okay. Ms. Mr. Parker, you wanted to make dollars and cents at the same time. What if you have to make a choice between making dollars and, uh, and uh, shoring up or enacting New York values? Errol, if you're an environmental voter in this election, I'm literally your only choice. I've spent 18 years on the Energy Committee um, as either the ranker or the chairman. I've been the chairman over the last uh, three years of the Energy and Telecom Committee here in the state of New York. Um, I'm literally the only one who's actually done this kind of work, right? Including negotiating the CLCPA um, and creating the environmental justice review panel that oversees all of the decisions that are made around uh, environment uh, around the environment in this in this state right and so this is a balancing act that we do every single day on the state level and it's things that you have to look at very very closely like the fact that you have companies that may also that may be simultaneously um, carbon producers and simultaneously, this also the largest sustainable energy producers at the same time. And how do you work um, to, to, to balance that um, within the context of a pension fund? And so those are the kind of decisions I'm making every single day now. Those are the kind of decisions and, and the leadership and the experience I want to bring to the city controller job and continue to build the, the, the clean energy economy, not just through the pension fund, but how we create full-time jobs at a living wage with benefits in our communities every single day, particularly in Black, Latino, and Asian communities. Okay, um, in our last uh, few minutes, I wanna bring up something, uh, procurement came up uh, as, as an issue. And I will tell you from having done this job uh, for over three decades now, I've heard the last three, if not four controllers say that they would uh, address a longstanding problem with procurement, which is that uh, social service nonprofit agencies that do business with the city of New York 
are often put in a terrible position. They're paid late. They're expected, in effect, to make a loan to the city of New York by performing the work first and getting the, uh, the, the money uh, on the backside and often finding even that can be uh, problematic. Um, again, some very smart people whose names I won't call who have been uh, 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 in the position that you're seeking have pledged to do something about it. Um, whenever I check in with nonprofits, they say uh, little, if anything, has been done. Uh, give us your best 30, 30 to 45 seconds on what you will actually do. Perhaps you've discovered something in the fine print or you've got some innovative idea that will get us out of this longstanding problem. Let's start with you, Mr. Benjamin. Thank you for the question. I think the first order of business is once a nonprofit has an agreement with an agency, the, the mayor, either it's the Office of Contract Services or it's OMB or some combination, there needs to be a joint process with the comptroller's office where we are reviewing those uh, contracts at uh, parallel processing. We cannot have a situation, which is presently now, where the, the contract goes from one agency to another agency to another agency. It could be a year before it even gets to the comptroller's office. In some cases, by the time the contract gets to the comptroller's office, the start date has long passed. We need to do those at the same time and we need to be aggressive, but that requires the comptroller to work with the mayor's office to come up with an agreed solution where we can together expedite this process through the bureaucracy. Okay, Mr. Lander. So I feel this one deeply. I ran two nonprofits that contracted with the city. My wife's on her fourth nonprofit, so um, this has to change. I'm a co-sponsor of a bill that Councilmember Helen Rosenthal is putting forward that would enable public tracking and tracking by the controller of contracts through the long, slow process that they currently move through city agencies. Right now, you can't see your way in there. It's like a black box. Um, the city has a, a system that it has set up for the agencies to look at, but we need to have the controller able to see that and the public and the nonprofits themselves able to see it. I did something similar passing a tracker for capital projects management, which similarly is slow and far behind. We don't have a universal tracking system for it. I passed that bill to set it up as controller. I will use both of those systems uh, to succeed where past controllers have not yet been able to. Okay, Mr. Parker. First of all, Brad, why I got to be a black box? No, I'm just joking. Oh, I apologize. Oh, All right. Uh, uh, blue no, box. I'm, I'm messing with you, Brad. I'm messing with you. Um, <laughs> That's very good. No, I got to watch it. <laughs> no, but, um, you know, look, I, I agree. I think there's a lot of ways that, that we can do this. I think my, my colleagues have some great ideas. But I think what I would do differently is simply eliminate the red tape, right? Like, we just simply need to change the law to make sure that first nonprofits get paid first. And we have to also create um, things that essentially say, if in fact this doesn't happen in a timely fashion, that is automatically approved. And that will force agencies to move faster. And so this is not about tracking the red tape. This is about eliminating the red tape. And that's what I'll do on day one. Okay, Ms. Patel. Um, so I serve on the board of two nonprofits right now and this pain point of not being reimbursed has actually gotten worse in the last eight years than it was previously. So not only have, has it not been addressed but it's actually gotten worse and I, fully agree with you know, Brad's proposition that we need to have more transparency and we need to be tracking it better and the nonprofit and the public need to be able to see it so they at least know how to budget. And mm -hmm. this whole process really leads out, leads out smaller nonprofits who are providing critical services in communities that the city isn't reaching but they can't even apply for these grants because they can't wait that long to get reimbursed. And um, I think using more technology and having more transparency uh, will move along the process Quicker. Okay, Mr. Weprin. Yes, when I was chairman of the Finance Committee of the City Council, uh, this was one of the major problems for not-for-profits because I uh, provided funding for not-for-profits in all five boroughs. Uh, I'm going to make a, a commitment tonight uh, and an announcement uh, uh, at this forum that when, if I'm elected controller, uh, I will open up an office in all five boroughs. Right now, there's a Manhattan office. Uh, I'd like an office in the other four boroughs as well. Uh, and that will make you closer uh, to the communities uh, and to a lot of these not-for-profits, uh, which will help streamline the process and, and, and meet with uh, different people in the community that are complaining about this particular in the uh, not-for-profit world. So uh, I will commit to open up an office in Brooklyn, as well as the, uh, the other four boroughs. Obviously we have one in Manhattan now, uh, but Brooklyn, Queens, Bro the Bronx, and Staten Island. 
Okay, that um, candidates, that brings us uh, to the end of our time. I wanna thank you for uh, an informative uh, discussion. A uh, part of the purpose of this event was to enable the district leaders of the Kings County Democratic Organization to, uh, to kick the tires, check you out, hear what you have to say. So we'll wish you the best of luck in your subsequent negotiations with them. <laughs> and of course, with the, uh, the all important petitions that they will be carrying on your behalf in just a few weeks. Thanks a whole lot and have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank Thank you. you so much. Arrow, good luck making it four hours. Yeah, dude. I mean, you know, I always tell people I love talking politics. I could do it all night. And <laughs> they're they're taking you up on it, huh? Yeah, it's like an all you can eat buffet, you know? Well, not live, just so you know. All deficit. Not afraid of the police unions. Look at my background, look at who I am. How would you expect to get that done? Basic income to lift people out of extreme poverty. Our proposal would be to expand child care. You know, I think you have to know who you are. We want to create 15 minute neighborhoods for every resident in this city. And we can do it. We can fix this city. This is your chance to meet the candidates. Please join us. Hello, once again. Thank you to our controller candidates for that informative and captivating debate. If you're just tuning in, welcome. I am Assembly Member Radnice Bichard Hermlin, Chair of the Brooklyn Democratic Party. The Kings County Democratic County Committee represents over 1.1 million registered Democrats, making us one of the largest county parties in the nation. I'm also honored to serve as the first black woman to lead a county party in New York City. It is a sign of our party's progress that we are all here today. I want to thank once again, the people who made this debate possible, our debate committee, district leaders and political clubs. I also wanna acknowledge our moderator this evening, Brooklyn's very own Errol Lewis. Errol is a CNN political commentator and the host of New York One's Inside City Hall, a nightly political show on Spectrum News. We are honored to have him as the moderator for this evening's debate. Now we will hear from the candidates about a role that needs no further introduction, the New York City Mayor. I'd like to welcome Brooklyn Borough President Eric Adams, Sean Donovan, Ray McGuire, New York City Comptroller Scott Stringer, Maya Wiley, Andrew Yang, Laurie Sutton, and Catherine Garcia. This is a pivotal race that will largely decide the city's continued recovery from the pandemic and fiscal crisis. We're facing unprecedented times and one of these candidates will help us heal and hopefully emerge stronger than ever. I am as excited as you are to hear about the city's next great mayor's plan. Let's dive in. Now back to you, Errol. All right, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, welcome to the last of uh, tonight's Kings County Democratic debates. I'm Errol Lewis, the political anchor at Spectrum News New York One. More importantly, I am a registered Democrat and longtime resident here in Crown Heights, and I'll be moderating this discussion. We're gonna talk for about an hour and also debate um, among the leading candidates for mayor. I am uh, well aware and appreciative that you all have been doing lots and lots of forums, including one that immediately preceded this one on the topic of education. In deference to uh, the, the folks who did that, I'm going to not ask education questions because I know uh, we'll be able to get your lively discussion from a different source. Um, as we all know, the incumbent mayor, Bill de Blasio of Park Slope is term limited, will not be seeking reelection. So uh, tonight we're going to hear from the leading candidates seeking that office. Uh, the rules for our discussion are as follows. We're not gonna have opening statements. Candidates will generally um, have 45 seconds to respond to my questions. There may be follow-up questions for clarity. Um, rebuttals to question are limited to uh, 30 seconds and we can continue that if 
if uh, the discussion gets lively and uh, is clarifying issues. We are going to have an, a cross-examination round in which each candidate will be allowed to ask one question to one of his or her rivals and get a one-minute response, <laughs> just question and answer. Um, all candidates are going to uh, be expected to weigh in on each major subject area. Our goal is a substantive discussion of how these candidates intend to tackle important issues uh, facing New York. So candidates, welcome. Good to see all of you. Um, I want to ask you about the pandemic. The next mayor is going to pick up wherever we happen to be on January 1st of next year. Uh, which part of the current uh, recovery plan, and, and I'm, I'm talking about the health side of it, the vaccination plan, which part of the current vaccination plan most needs improvement? And what would you do differently if you were mayor right now? Let's start with you, Mr. Adams. Uh, thank you, Errol. Uh, the entire uh, process has been an embarrassment and is the highest level of dysfunctionality uh, that I've ever witnessed in my life. Uh, and it's not as though we did not know. And I communicated uh, with City Hall that the most important aspect of this is a real time process. Everyone that was given the vaccine should have had a handheld device put in the ethnicity, the zip code, and the gender of the per individuals receiving the vaccine. This way we could have looked at in real time to correct any mistakes we've had. Finding out that black and brown people were not given that vaccine is an embarrassment and it is an insult to this entire city. Mm. Mr. Donovan. Thanks, Errol, great to see you. Look, my 80 year old mother-in-law who has a lung condition had her vaccine appointment canceled last week. This is personal to me. And we need to do three things. First of all, we need a mayor who can actually get the help that we need from Washington DC to increase the number of vaccines coming here. I worked side by side with Dr. Fauci on Ebola, on Zika, uh, when I was in President Obama's cabinet. I can bring the help we need from DC. Second, we need a mayor who actually understands how to build the health infrastructure and outreach in communities, particularly black and brown communities around Brooklyn and around this city to ensure that we have uh, vaccination sites and the opportunity for everyone to be vaccinated in this city. And then third, we need to make sure we have a mayor who understands how to manage large complex problems. I oversaw the $4 trillion budget. Uh, I oversaw a $50 billion budget uh, at HUD and have been engaged again and again in crisis management from Sandy uh, to so many others. I have the leadership and experience that could end this pandemic in New York. Okay, uh, Ms. Garcia, who is not dealing with a snowstorm tonight. But you know, I, I feel at a loss to not be able to track uh, trucks all evening and all tomorrow and get up and talk to you at 5 a.m. It's a loss to me. Uh, but I put out a VAX plan uh, that is clear that we did not define the problem correctly. The problems that have been, we want to vaccinate our most vulnerable. What are the challenges that they have to getting an appointment? Oh, language, uh, technology, disability. We needed to bring vaccines to this population via mobile trucks. I've set those types of systems up and we needed to lean on our nonprofit sector who are key trusted stakeholders. They know these people. They could have been setting up pre-appointments before the vaccine ever even got here. And we would be making great strides on ensuring that our most vulnerable people, the people who got hit hardest by COVID were being served now. Mm -hmm. uh, at this point in time, it's like trying to get a concert ticket uh, for you know, a rock concert. If you can stay on the line long enough, you'll eventually get through. Uh, but many people can't do that and we should have facilitated it. I know how to set up those systems. I've done it. I've done it with food. I've done it with sanitation. I've done it with DEP. Okay. Mr. McGuire, what has gone wrong and what would you be doing differently? Grossly ineptly managed. It's all been poorly managed starting from the federal government when we first had this. Today, we have a situation where of the people who have reported their race, 300,000 or so, 48% of people who received the vaccine are white, 11% are black. What this, what this has identified is the systemic equities that I've talked about before. We have healthcare deserts. We know where the issues are for the most, who have been most disproportionately impacted. We fail miserably. 
starting from the federal government, to identify and now disseminate the vaccine to those who are most at risk. I would change and I would plan to make sure that we address the healthcare desert first, the most vulnerable first. I would completely plan for this and make sure that we would never ever encounter anything like this before. And I managed through crisis, so I know how to get this done. Okay, uh, Mr. Stringer. Well, good morning for Mayor, because we just got to manage the hell out of this city. And proof point is this vaccination plan by the city is an absolute failure. Uh, today, I joined with Jamani Williams to again uh, implore the mayor to take action to fix these three websites that younger people can't access for their parents. You know, imagine Sean not being able to answer 51 questions on a website just to help his parents. That's not right. And second, we've called for more data because we wanted to make good strategic decisions. And what we saw today was not just data that showed real discrimination in the vaccine program, but no real plan to redirect resources in different languages and different strategies to make sure that everyone who is eligible for a vaccine can get it. And this is the continuing failure of a city hall that has failed to manage over the last seven years. But this now is life or death. Look, we really didn't know that this virus was here, but we knew when the virus hit that a vaccine really was on the way. Any medical journal would have informed City Hall that it was coming. And it certainly was here by November. And the fact that we have not been able to manage a two car funeral to get this done has to change. And part of the way we do that is by fixing the things in front of us. I've outlined a comprehensive plan on how to get the vaccine moving. The mayor has adopted some of my ideas, 24 seven vaccination sites, because I do believe the Biden administration will eventually move uh, vaccines into the city, but we have to be ready for the capacity because we're not gonna open up this city's economy unless we inoculate and we inoculate in a fair and just way. Okay, Ms. Sutton. Yes, hi, Errol. So listen, here we go again. We got exactly the results that one would predict when there is no planning, no coordination. The mayor and the governor, as usual, were jockeying back and forth as the first vaccines came out. And this is, as has been said, a life and death issue. So, you know, if we could deliver 6 million vaccines for smallpox in 1947 in two to three weeks, what we're missing here is not the resources, it's not even perhaps the, the intention, but certainly it's the leadership, it's the managerial and operational competency, it's the ability to execute on the ground and adapt to shifting conditions, and it's the character and competence to lead during life and death. Okay, Ms. Wiley. Rana Mungan. Black woman, 30 years old, public school teacher, East New York. And she's dead from COVID because she tried two times before she was finally allowed to get a COVID test. This is not a problem that should surprise us because it really is about our failure over and over and over again to recognize that it is communities of color, Black, Latino, Asian, that are always hit first, always hit hardest in every single disaster, and yet we never prepare in advance. And I, as a racial justice advocate, actually worked on suing to keep maternal and childcare beds in Harlem and lobbying on civil rights provisions for healthcare reform during the Clinton years. I can tell you that all one of the things we had to do is say in advance, recognizing we had already botched it with testing, recognized that this administration already made a major mistake when it took contact tracing out of the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, that we needed to re-engage on a vaccine distribution plan that understood it was communities of color that were hit first, that were hit hardest, that had the highest numbers of people who were vulnerable and with whom we had to listen and learn and lead in partnership with what would be the best vaccine distribution strategies so we could just end the disparities and ensure that all our vulnerable people got the vaccines they deserve. Okay, Mr. Yang. Errol, you look so good and casual. Uh, there's something about like, I, I gotta say, it's a great look. You should bring it to TV. Um, 
so this rollout has been incredibly frustrating for so many. And there are three sites in Brooklyn that had this scenario play out over this weekend, which is you had dozens of workers, you had hundreds of vaccines or doses, and then you didn't have the patients. Uh, and where they, there was one doctor who reported vaccinating three patients all day when they had vaccinated 70 on an earlier occasion. And making matters worse, they were told that they could not reach out to patients to actually fill that, that capacity for the day. Uh, this is just a, a failure of bureaucracy and leadership at an unconscionable level. Because at this point, any delay in vaccine rollout is costing us lives and costing us a chance at a genuine recovery. My job as your mayor will be to accelerate our recovery as quickly as possible and do it in an equitable way. If we, we all know that people of color are not going to get vaccinated at the same levels if you have a level playing field because they have lower access technology, lower levels of resources, less time. So what you wanna do is you wanna actually bring it to them in Brownsville and say, look, we're gonna change the age el eligibility in this community to try and equalize it. And then you need a way to quickly verify that you've been vaccinated on your smartphone so that we can reopen schools, we can reopen our places of business, we can reopen the city for the 60 million missing tourists who supported over 300,000 jobs in our city. This is mission critical and a failure on this level that's costing us lives is completely unconscionable. Okay, thank you, candidates. Um, I want to um, start a, uh, we can take maybe about 10 minutes to uh, have a, a discussion about public safety. And I want to start with you, Mr. Adams. You uh, made a proposal that was adopted wholesale by the current mayor uh, to have uh, community precinct councils uh, contribute to the process of selecting and evaluating uh, precinct commanders. Uh, as you know, my dad actually had that job for a number of years as well in Brooklyn. Um, the, the flip side of, of having community input in who runs the local precinct is the potential for corruption. Uh, and we've seen a lot of that even without uh, input from, from precinct councils. How would you guard against that? Okay, and, and, and Eric, may I have a point of uh, clarity? Yes. Because I believe at the start of the forum, you stated 45 seconds for answers. I'm on my forums with my colleagues and it seemed like I'm the only one that's respecting the time limits. If 45 seconds are creative 45 seconds, let me know and then I'll be creative and I'll get my point longer. Well, I'll tell you the, 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 the true answer, of course, and you all have worked with me enough to know, these are guidelines that are intended to facilitate a conversation. So okay. I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna cut people off at, at 61 seconds. We wanna make sure we get our ideas out. Okay, I just get cut off a lot. So I just want to get some clarity on the rules of the game. Understood. Okay, uh, so thank you for your, your question. And I want to be clear, the mayor's plan did not go far enough. And I believe that we should put together a panel made up of community board members, precinct council, civic, uh, youth organizations and group to sit down, interview the precinct commanders so the precinct commanders will come up with their full position on how they're going to fight crime, how they're going to deal with the issues in the community and enforcement in the community. In addition to that, we could use the new law 50A to look at the background of the precinct commander so we'll know who this person is. Is he a good fit for the community? And it is the job of the DOI, IOB, IAB, and other agencies to deal with co corruption. We can't let the fear of corruption get in the way of having real community input and dealing with choosing a powerful position as a precinct commander. Okay, I mean, the, uh, the, the, the concern and the reason um, I, I, I raise it, Ma Maya Wiley, is that we know there is, and you know this as a former chair of the Civilian Complaint Review Board, uh, there are bad there are bad actors out there um, on both sides of the badge. Uh, the the fear I would have is what if a faction fight uh, is lost by a group and then that or, or the winners of a faction fight that names the next precinct commander, all of a sudden they're getting extra placards. All of a sudden they get an extra phone call, an early phone call if their kid is in a bar fight. All of a sudden we've opened the door for all kinds of misconduct. Uh, that, that we'd have to be concerned about. What, what do you think of that? I think that's exactly some of what we have to be concerned about. We do have to put the public back in public safety. And I think this is a discussion that acknowledges that communities have to be an active and engaged voice and partner in doing that. And what I mean by that is the policies and the priorities of policing, 
what police should be doing and sh what they should not be doing, like mental health uh, distress calls. And that we should be making sure that the rules of the road, the patrol guide, are bright and clear and do not allow so much gray that police officers get off when there's been misconduct and that we should have public engagement, active and aggressive in what those priorities and what those rules of the road are. But it does take a strong mayor willing to stand up to police unions as well as willing to engage with communities and ensuring true civilian oversight on what police are doing, how, why, and what they're not doing and hold them accountable. Okay. Um, Ms. Sutton, let, let's uh, pick up on that that uh, that thought that Eric Adams uh, uh, put out there. We want to get more public involvement, uh, but we have to do it the right way. What, in your opinion, would be the right way to do that? Absolutely. I think that, uh, yes, it's important to put the public at in public safety, but it's also equally important to put the safety back in public safety. Right now, the public is scared. 70% of New Yorkers are afraid if they come back to work uh, that they're going to be subject to the kinds of headlines and violent crimes that we've seen repeatedly over these last several months. I do absolutely in my public safety plan, I propose standing up a public safety coordination council, which brings in not only NYPD, but seven other agencies of city government, including myself, run by the mayor, bringing in also on a quarterly basis, members of the public, civic stakeholders, advocates, so that we can have really transparent ownership of public safety and sharing of its both blessings and burdens. Mm. Yeah, uh, and uh, Catherine Garcia, I mean, uh, interagency uh, dis discussion, uh, raises, of course, the point that public safety is not just the NYPD, right? There's probation, there's correction, uh, there, there's a lot of, of other stuff going on. Uh, how do we do a, a better job of both making full use of all of those institutions as well as bringing the public in, into, the, uh, into the, the direction of public safety? This is an incredibly important conversation that we're having, but it's also about management. It's about management of a uniformed agency and ensuring that they are doing what they are supposed to do at the direction of the mayor and ensuring that the community is part of that conversation. But I'll tell you right now that I had community board members come to me because they liked their district superintendent at sanitation and they didn't want me to move him. Uh, but that has to occur. You have to have managerial flexibility in order to actually be equal across the city and ensure that we are giving equal services. And nobody has done that uh, and managed a uniform force of 10,000 to get that done. But I would ensure that we are clear about what the rules of the road are. I agree with Maya. Uh, you have to know where, what you are allowed to do and what you are not allowed to do and what we want you to confront and what we don't want you to confront. But I have to tell you that in dealing with pop-ups of homeless encampments, with homeless services, with sanitation and with PD was very successful. Uh, and having City Hall coordinate that mm -hmm. was very important to our success. It is what often uh, we don't do well. And I would say another piece that was very successful was the MAP program where uh, the mayor's office brought together all of those agencies. Right. Let me let me go to to, uh, to you, Ray McGuire. Uh, we've had two uh, very big conversations in this city uh, uh, in 2020 about public safety. We had many, 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 many demonstrations over uh, the need for more accountability. Uh, but we've also seen a doubling of shootings and a, an upsurge in crime. If you get sworn in next January 1st, how, how will you handle that? First of all, let, let me say I uh, would make certain that the system that I have is not a one where we'd have to police the police nor manage through factions. This comes with leadership and it comes with management. How would I handle this? I would make certain that the culture that is important in the NYPD is a culture that reflected my values. It's got to be a culture of respect, accountability and proportionality. There's no trust. There's no respect between the police and the community. We need to restore that by putting police and people who can represent the greatest needs in the community, like mental health care professionals. We need to make sure that we restore that, restore community policing, make sure that we have venues, places where the police and the community can, can convene. So you re-begin to establish that relationship. Accountability. 
We pay $200 million a year for those who are serial misbehaviors. The community doesn't trust that a, a, that a police person who has misbehaved is going to be held accountable. We need, to be, we need to have visible accountability. And the last thing is proportionality. It's been said, if the only thing that you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. When it comes to black and brown communities, it's a sledgehammer. And so I would restore and instill a culture of what I call rap, respect, accountability, and proportionality. And also what I would do is to reallocate, reallocate the dollars that are in the police budget. I want better policing. Black and brown people want better policing. And so I would reallocate those dollars, restructure so that I could get dollars into the mental health care professionals. If four out of every 10 calls that go to 9-11 have to do with mental health care issues, I'd get the mental health care professionals involved and I would invest those dollars in the mental health care professionals. I would also invest in the community-based organizations mm -hmm. that can help alleviate the crime, including the, the, the violence interrupters. Okay. I would let make me, sure that's where the dollars went. So that's how I would address it. Let me, let me bring uh, Scott Stringer into this conversation. Um, he's often um, referred to, tracked, and published numbers on the, uh, the financial mm -hmm. cost of uh, police misconduct. And I know you've been uh, following the defund debate, which gets to much of what Ray McGuire was talking about. What's your sense of where we need to go in public safety? Well, let me just spend 10 seconds as somebody, I think, on the Zoom call who has gone to more community precinct council meetings uh, around the city over the last eight years than most people combined. Uh, I could tell you that it is important for the community, uh, community precinct councils to meet with the police captain. But remember, there's different views of policing in communities. And the leadership has to come from the police commissioner and the mayor, because what we've seen right now is a mayor who's lost control of the police department. And I do believe we should look at police resources and shift those resources to actual do the policing, to up the conveyance rates, to empower uh, more senior police officers in communities. And at the same time, as Ray said, use the ability now to move to mental health and guidance counselors and valued members of communities to prevent kids from getting caught up in the criminal justice system. This is happening all over the country. And we're seeing it in uh, Eugene, Oregon with mental health calls. We're seeing it with creative policing. And we're now lagging behind because we have a paralyzed police department. And in terms of resources, we can cut the budget and reinvest that budget in the kind of programs that keep people away from the criminal justice system. I put out a billion dollar cut over four years. Advocates would like more, but the truth is we have to be bold in our thinking on this because change is coming. And what we saw over the summer, Errol, the batons and the pushing of young people, people of color, just protesting black lives and a police department out of control. It is time to have a mayor who knows management, who can be a leader that will have zero tolerance for abuse. And then I do agree that we have to have community uh, interaction with police. But remember, there are some communities who don't share the policing values of others. And that's why you need the mayor to step in and have one unified uh, system. Andrew Yang, you put out a proposal to, uh, your, or a pledge, frankly, to name a police commissioner who you described as a civilian. I assume that means somebody who has not been a cop, not been a uniform cop before. Um, say, say a little more about what difference that would make. It's very difficult to reform a culture if you are of that culture. Uh, and right now, far too many New Yorkers fear that if they encounter a police officer in the wrong circumstances, then, uh, you know, then they're, they're going to end up with their, their rights uh, infringed on instead of protected. Um, but to echo what Scott and uh, Lori were saying is that right now violent crime is rising and resolution rates are going down. Like that is a chief concern to many, many New Yorkers. So you need to hold the police accountable, not just for potential civil rights uh, abuses, but for catching the people that are perpetrating violent crimes in growing numbers. You also have to keep in mind the greater context, which is that empty streets with closed storefronts and 700,000 missing jobs are all driving criminality. So a lot of this is about trying to, again, speed up the recovery, because if you manage to get New York City back on its feet, then many of the streets that people are afraid to walk right now will actually become vibrant and safe again. Okay, um, so uh, Sean Donovan, um, violence up, clearance rates are down, um, a city on edge. What does Mayor Donovan do about it? So Errol, I wanna agree with many of the things that have been said about true transparency and accountability. Uh, we 
can't have better policing in this city without knowing what officers are doing and being able to hold them accountable. One of the things that's critical to that, you talk about rebuilding trust in communities. Why is the police the only agency in city government that doesn't have a requirement to live in our communities? If there's any uh, agency, any issue in this city where making sure folks understand the communities they're policing and can build relationships, it is there. So I would change and, and uh, make sure there was a residency requirement. I also believe, I wanna disagree with, with uh, Andrew about this. I've seen examples across the country of leadership that has changed culture. Uh, Chuck Ramsey, the African-American police chief of Philadelphia, who was the leader of President Obama's 21st Century Policing Task Force, which I was part of, changed the culture there. What's needed is real leadership. We should take military equipment away from our police the way I did when I was budget director and hold them accountable. And we need to reduce what we're asking the police to do. We should not be asking them to patrol the hallways of our schools, to criminalize homelessness. We should focus them on guns and violent crime, the things that communities are, are worried about. And that way we can have safety and respect at the same time. Okay, very good. Um, candidates, uh, I thank you for that discussion. We are going to uh, pick up the, 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 the pace a little bit. Let's go to our uh, cross-examination, as a matter of fact. We uh, promised you each a chance to ask well, one of your rivals one question, and uh, we'll take uh, one minute to answer it, and that will be the end of that exchange. Uh, let's start with you. We'll go in reverse alphabetical order. Let's start with you, Mr. Yang. Reverse alphabetical order is my favorite, um, ever since I was a kid. Um, <laughs> So, so Scott, admire your work as comptroller. One of the things that um, I, I've been struck by is that our property tax system is uh, highly inequitable and hasn't really been reformed since 1975. Um, have you examined property tax reform as a way to either uh, uh, reduce the inequities um, in our city uh, or potentially as a source of revenue? Andrew, good question. And fun fact about me, uh, I'm the former chair of the Real Property Taxation uh, committee in Albany. And that was the committee that nobody wanted. And the rebels usually would get that committee. And when I got that committee, I inherited the $1 billion tax assessor scandal and was able through my investigative work to clean that system up. But along the way, uh, I have seen the disparities in the, in the system. Uh, it's a system of winners and losers in the four classes. Uh, the mayor and the city council proposed changes to the system. They had a commission. Nobody has acted on that uh, since, uh, since the onset of COVID. Uh, as mayor, I'm going to look at those recommendations, continue the work of holding hearings, building consensus. And I think part of the key to getting a more fair uh, uh, real property taxation system is to get away from that winner or loser uh, mentality, to make sure that we don't overburden the poorest people in the city, we make it fair and equitable, and it's going to take a lot of political will to have those conversations. But, you know, Andrew, as someone who has spent some time, I mean, I don't talk about it a lot because people kind of gaze about it, but it is, a complicated, it is a complicated system that does require leadership. So I agree with you that this is an issue we should be talking about. And of course, homeowners pay very strict attention to every word about this. Uh, I think the notice- As they are right my, now. I just got my notice the other day. Congratulations, your house is worth X, tax bill to follow. Um, Maya Wiley, you can ask a question of one of the folks here on the call. Unmute, please. Yeah. All right. COVID land, unmute. Andrew, I'm glad you said that to be, you can't lead a culture chain if you're, if you're of the culture. And I was shocked to hear about uh, in a Me Too era and in an era where we had access Hollywood and with all the progress we've made, that in your campaign, there was a culture that was very harassing and demeaning for women. And, I, and, and you admitted to leading that and, and apologized for not changing it. And yet in your campaign, and as a civil rights lawyer, I was shocked to hear that you have a non-disclosure agreement that sounds very Trumpian. Will you commit to allowing your campaign staff to complain publicly about workplace misconduct? Uh, thanks for the question, Maya. We've already uh, discontinued those ND, uh, NDAs, which were actually for employees that were data volunteers, and they were going to see all sorts of 
information, but we discontinued them just to clarify for folks that we have absolutely nothing to hide. Uh, and uh, I'm on the record as saying that everything works better when you have uh, great women leaders like many of the people on this call tonight uh, leading in tandem. Um, the organization I ran, the company I ran, had about half women leaders in uh, marketing, HR operations. And then the nonprofit I ran actually had majority women. And uh, my successor as CEO was this incredible woman leader. Um, one of my co-campaign managers is a woman of color, uh, Sasha Huja. So you know, like I could not agree more with the fact that uh, you, you need to have women in positions of leadership in order to actually operate at the highest levels. And you had no NDAs in any of those other positions. Um, you know, Ms. Ms. Uh, Ms. Sutton, you can ask a question. Sure. So, Eric, a year ago on Martin Luther King Day, your message to Brooklynites was if they'd come from places like Iowa and uh, Ohio to go home. If you were to become mayor, would your message to all New Yorkers be different? If so, how? If not, why not? Uh, first of all, it was not to Brooklynites. It was to those throughout this city uh, that called the police on black men. If they don't have, if they have a, a dog off a leash, it was to those that overwhelmingly called 911 uh, on black men just for walking down the block. It's for those who call uh, the police because they hear noise coming from a building on Sundays that happens to be a church. Uh, it is the belief that you could displace communities instead of engaging communities. And the spirit of my whole speech, if you would have listened to, and I hope people will go back to it, because it was an entire speech of how we define crises and how we are displacing the ideas and communities of long-term residents who built this city, not only Brooklyn, they built this city. And now that we have become a popular place, uh, we have attempted to displace everyday New Yorkers uh, through uh, high property uh, rentals, uh, through not engaging in the local stores and businesses, not being part of New York. And so if you don't want to be part of this great diverse city of New York, that was the message I was sending to all those who feel as though they're better than the everyday New Yorker that swipes that Metro card, that put food on our stores and that engage in a city of diversity. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question, Mr. Stringer. Let's see, Mr. McGuire, uh, tonight 60,000 New Yorkers, half children are going to sleep on, in our homeless shelters. It's going to be another snowy night, dangerous conditions. I thought I'd give you an opportunity to talk about how we're going to move people out of shelter and change this homeless crisis that has just been so part of the discussion, but yet everyone seems paralyzed to make systemic change. And I thought I'd give you an opportunity to talk a little bit about that. You know, uh, it's a great it's a great question, uh, Eric, and, and uh, I mean, Scott, and thank you for asking. Listen, we have a moral and a legal responsibility for the homeless. We need funding and we need leadership and a clear strategy and accountability. We are treating people differently. Different populations have different needs. A majority of the homeless today are families with school children. We need better support there. We need to build truly affordable housing, not housing that is based on an area of median income based on Westchester, but truly affordable housing. And we need to make certain that we have the wraparound services to make certain that uh, for those people who are homeless, especially those who are suffering from mental illness, that we have the services available to them so that we can begin to address it. But first, it goes to the economic plan that I have of building truly affordable housing such that when you lose your job or first doesn't take 50 to 60% of your income to pay your rent. And then when you lose your job, you become homeless. So we need to be able to build and give our citizens jobs so they don't get into the situation of being homeless. And when they find themselves homeless, let's make certain that we have transition services and that we have homes. It shouldn't be the case, Scott, that we pay $500 a night for someone to stay in a shelter when we can build to make certain that they have truly affordable houses and a room over the truly affordable homes and a roof over their head and the services that surround them to make sure that they can live with dignity. And that's how I would go about it. Okay, Mr. McGuire, your turn to ask a question. Yeah, I would ask, um, 
I would ask Catherine Garcia, we through all of these forums have talked about what's not working well in the city. If you had to identify one or two things that are working well, what would you identify? Well, I would identify first and foremost that tonight sanitation will do an absolutely phenomenal job uh, plowing snow. When I started there, it was all paper. You would have walked in the door, gotten into a spreader and been given a sheet of paper to follow along. Now they all have turn by turn directions. That's the type of change that I made in the Department of Sanitation. Uh, most things are not working well right now. Online school is a disaster. Uh, the rollout of the vaccine plan is a disaster. Uh, we do not have healthcare that is reaching people right now. There are so many pieces across the city where we are not getting what people need to them. And people in New York City want essential services done well. They want to be safe in their communities. They want their kids to go to school. And they definitely want sanitation to be plowing tonight. Uh, and that is the type of experience that I have and that I bring to the table. I know how to make it work. I have made it work in extremely challenging situations. Thank you. Okay, and uh, Ms. Garcia, your turn to ask a question. So we haven't asked a lot of the women questions, so I'm gonna ask Maya Wiley a question. Uh, you know, we've talked a lot about equity, but what would be your specific plan for NYCHA with their $40 billion worth of need? Yeah, thank you, Catherine. Uh, look, we have $40 billion worth, worth of need. And when I talk to public housing residents, one of the primary things I hear and what I will start with is public housing has to stay public. And that is our best base of a permanently affordable housing. So it includes engaging, having a governance process where NYCHA residents have the ability to understand, have it available to them what the money is, where it's going, and how best to spend it and prioritize it. Absolutely work with the federal government because it has not and must do more of its fair share of investing in the capital of NYCHA. But I would also say, and what we have already committed to do in New Deal New York, is $10 billion to create 100,000 jobs focused on communities of color, communities hard hit by COVID, and also having 25% unemployment rates, but to solve community problems. And we don't need anyone's permission for that $10 billion. We can do that right now. And we've committed at least 2 billion of that to actually start to bring back self safety and dignity to residents, but giving them some opportunity to say what that money should be spent on. Okay. Okay. Mr. Donovan. Thanks, Errol. Uh, Ray, I want to go back to a conversation we had the other night on a different Brooklyn forum uh, with Reverend Foy in the in the wee hours of the morning. And, um, you know, I talked about having looked in the eyes of families around Brooklyn in the midst of the mortgage crisis and having seen two thirds of black wealth destroyed in this country by that that crisis. I, I want to understand your thinking about what caused that, and particularly having served at an institution at City that was, played such a central role in uh, the foreclosure crisis we saw, what you did as a leader there uh, in those days uh, of crisis. So Sean Obama, one thing that you can recognize here is, and I think you know something about finance, you know that I work in investment banking for 40 some odd years, which is different to where the, where the crisis occurred. And so I wanna make certain that, and I think you know this, given the relationship and given your history here, at least how you talk about it. And so I didn't have anything to do with that, but let me tell you, as one of the leaders on Wall Street and certainly one of the only one who looks like me for as long as I was on Wall Street, I made certain that we began to address that becoming one of the leading lenders in truly affordable housing, making investments in the communities, making investments in summer jobs, making certain that the firm committed to folks in the neighborhood and making certain that I continued to invest with a verifiable track record into the communities, especially those who were the hardest hit. So I have a track record, Sean, of having invested in the communities, especially during the times of the crisis, 
and also making certain that the institutional priorities were focused just on these industries. So I think you look at the track record, which you know well, and look at the things the leadership I've taken to address the communities, not only in my position as leader of uh, the investment bank, which is separate to where the mortgage crisis took place, but also as a leader in the community, making certain that I personally invested in making certain that communities and people who are entrepreneurs in those communities were able to rise up, which is the, the job plan that I have, go big, go forward, go big, go small, go forward, to make sure that these communities get empowered. And one thing I would say, it is now so often the case that we, we satisfy ourselves because black and brown people have been outside for so long that we satisfy ourselves that giving them crumbs is gonna be sufficient and they feel full. I'm not interested in the crumbs. Okay. Matter of fact, I'm not interested in the cake. I'm interested in us owning the bakery so that we can get from the lower class to the middle class and have the home ownerships. And I've been so invested in that and I'm quite proud of that. So thank you for asking the question. Very good. Last but not least, Mr. Adams. Ray, that was funny in the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my question, my question uh, is, uh, uh, Sean, um, I, I, I've heard you talk about um, several areas around education. And as uh, I seem sometimes to be alone in this space, uh, a, when a child is in their mother's womb, uh, four weeks, they have uh, 10,000 uh, brain cells. At 24 weeks, they have 10 billion. Uh, everyone talks about zero to three. Of, are we ignoring the science of prenatal of uh, how important that is. Uh, what are your thoughts around prenatal? I don't hear anyone talking about this but me. So Eric, I, you've been eloquent on this subject and uh, we've, we've been on a lot of these forums together now. I think you've heard that one of the most profound experiences for me was the ability when we had both our boys to work with a midwife who has become part of our family. Uh, for me, there is much more we need to be doing. And I agree with you so much of what you said about this, that we need to be investing at that critical, critical time of life. One of the things that I've found in the work that I've done here in the city and across the country is that we miss so many opportunities to work more effectively uh, with women before uh, they give birth to make sure that we have all of the healthcare, all of the nutritional needs. Just give you one example. When we were implementing the most aggressive lead paint law in the country under uh, when I was housing commissioner, I worked very closely with the health commissioner, Tom Frieden. And what we found is that we were missing so many opportunities. Every time one of my inspectors was in an apartment, if uh, there was a woman who was pregnant, we wanted to carry and give to her information about uh, the nurse family partnership and, and vice versa. We needed to be doing much more to break down the silos across government and work, work much more effectively to reach. We touch uh, people in the city over and over again, and we need a, a, a mayor and a, and a government that works to connect those services much better than we do today. Okay, thank you candidates. Um, kind of coming down the home stretch here, there are a million other questions that I'd love to ask you, but I wanna, I wanna end on something that is, is a big issue in Brooklyn and, and, and around the city as well, of course, uh, which is when we come to affordable housing, uh, the, the immediate question is affordable for who, right? Um, the the, uh, the, the uh, usual, um, uh, uh, the, the usual metric is area median income, which in turn leads to an additional fight. Are we talking about New York metropolitan area? Are we talking about the five boroughs? Are we talking about the county? Are we talking about the community board? Are we talking about, you know, plus or minus a quarter mile of the development site in question? Um, I would like each of you to just take a real 60 seconds, Eric Adams, uh, a real 60 seconds. Um, what, what's your thinking on that? You know, there we have in Brooklyn, what I would call a, a sort of a broad consensus. The broad consensus is that if it's not pitched to the people who live right there uh, within a hundred feet of the, of the development zone, it's a problem. Uh, are you willing to fight against that consensus? Do you have a different way of, of con conceptualizing the whole thing? Um, let's start with you, Ms. Wiley. Look, we have an administration that did bean counting rather than problem solving when it 
came to affordability. And we have the opportunity to actually reach all the folks who need affordable housing by having a long-term planning process that engages community in that long-term plan, setting principles so that we're developing in communities appropriately, but the ways that we meet affordable housing needs and every single neighborhood needs affordable housing. And that has to be one of the principles that also means changing how we're doing zonings so that we're reforming the system so that it's principled, responsive, and has some voice, but the decisions have to be guided by the principles themselves. And that should include an equity impact assessment. Okay. Sean, Sean Donovan, you've, you've, been on, you, you've been in this um, for decades. I, I have. And look, there is no question that we need to reach deeper affordability. The problem is most people go directly to AMI, and if you change it in the wrong way, that what that would mean is that the more than 100,000 New York families that depend on Section 8 vouchers would be dramatically restricted in where they could move with those vouchers. And so we need to attack this in the right way, not just by saying AMI is wrong, because if you change AMI overall, you're actually going to hurt hundreds of thousands of, of New Yorkers. What I believe is that we need to have a plan that gets to more deeply affordable housing. And the only way to do that, we know that it costs more than $500 a month to run an apartment in New York, whether you're a nonprofit, the city or a for-profit owner, we need more section eight. We need more uh, operating assistance so that the very lowest income people, think about it, $500 a month for a family if it's 30% of their income is going to be more uh, over uh, $12,000. If you're making $10,000 uh, a year, you're never going to be able to afford it. So that's a piece of it. The second is home ownership. I started 25 years ago with Reverend Youngblood creating Nehemiah housing in Brooklyn. And what we showed is that you could move directly out of public housing buy your first home and be able to build wealth in a way that fundamentally changed the equation of uh, gentrification and displacement. That's something we need to be investing in as well. Okay, Scott Stringer. Look, uh, when Bloomberg was mayor and Sean was at his side, uh, it was all about building as many units of so-called affordable housing. De Blasio becomes mayor, Maya knows this, he wanted to double Bloomberg. So it was this whole fight about how much unaffordable affordable housing can we build? I have a different approach. I think we should look at the hundreds of vacant lots, 566 in Brooklyn. Instead of giving the big real estate guns the land, let's invest in community-based organizations. Let's give the subsidies to get that AMI that is affordable in our communities. Part of what I wanna do is repurpose 421A. That's a giveaway to the wealthiest developers. Let's purpose that subsidy to actually build the housing that we need. Mayor LaGuardia built public housing. He went to Washington, cried to uh, Roosevelt, we got public housing. Then we built the Mitchell Amo housing program. Koch gave abandoned buildings back to the people. We can no longer think that luxury developers are gonna build affordable housing. One, they're all REITs. They can't get, they, they can't, it's, it's not a business plan that works for them. So we have all of these great community-based organizations. Let's take our vacant city-owned property. Let's pass a land bank plan in the city council. And then let's start integrating neighborhoods and not rely on as of right zoning. Let's talk about integration and affordability in all our communities. De Blasio only rezoned the communities of color and pushed people out. But there's okay. been no rezoning on the Upper West Side or the Upper East Side. I would fundamentally change this housing, radically change this housing program. Ray, Ray McGuire, this is um, what in uh, academic circles is often referred to as market failure, right? We just have... Uh a market that is not providing a, a, an essential good, and that's where government steps in. What do you do about affordable housing? So let's go through some of the facts first. Um, at, when we build and when we're building, we used to build 2.2 units of housing for every new job in the city. Now we build 0.5. The housing demand has so outpaced the supply that it's gotten too expensive. If you look at even before COVID, more than half of low income between 15 and $30,000, we're paying at least 50% of their income in rent. So what do we need to do? We do need to restructure with the federal government's help, AMI, and we do need to make certain that we can build, and this is the most expensive city in which to build. 
It is also the most archaic when it comes to remedity and when it comes to all the things that you need to get in order to get a, a, a place built. And it also comes down to how houses are built, sustainability. We're way off the market. And you're right, there's a market failure. So what do you need to do? First, as you're building affordable housing, you need to bring the price down. You need to include the community, which has not been done before, at least not done adequately in any time in recent history. So those who are most at risk and those who are, who are potentially displaced get a say-so in what takes place in their communities. And so we have to start with the community and we have to build from there. We need to make certain that we don't incentivize and subsidize those people who are paying two to $3,000 where we're subsidized and that's not the community. So we need to restructure the entire system. Eric Adams, as borough president, you were uh, involved with uh, the community boards who fought this out at the ground level for most of the last decade. What is your take on where affordability needs to be set and how would you do that as mayor? Well, uh, first of all, we need to, uh, preservation is crucial. Crucial. We need to preserve uh, what we have, uh, particularly in NYCHA. I would uh, sell, sell the air rights over NYCHA, which would give us $8 billion uh, that we can go in to repair uh, NYCHA. We focus on a lot of development. I agree with Scott. Uh, we did too far too much development in poorer communities where we upzone. Uh, the housing crisis is a citywide crisis. We need to do building in those areas that have quality schools, great uh, transportation. And then we need to look at United Way's report. 40% uh, of New Yorkers had a sufficiency deficit and I believe it was 2019. When we talk about housing, we have to stop ignoring the middle class. Uh, that teacher and accountant, we want them here in the city. So we need to ensure we have low income and middle income. And uh, I think Sean was right. Uh, they did an amazing job in places like uh, East New York where they did uh, the Nehemiah housing. We have to get back into the Nehemiah housing and back into um, having uh, low, low um, condoms, co co uh, condominiums as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ms. Garcia. Thank you. I think it's critically important that we are putting affordable housing across the city. When you think back to the, some of the criticisms of NYCHA is that you are putting poor people all together and that having communities that have the butcher, the financier and the teacher all able to live there is critical. But you're right, many of us on this panel, we can't chase a unit number. We have to accept the fact that if we're going to build deeply affordable housing, we're going to build fewer units. Um, and I have put forward a plan that talks about putting building 50,000 deeply affordable units. So we're not making affordable housing that's going to cost you $3,500 a month, which isn't really affordable uh, to anyone. But we also have an opportunity right now with the challenges that the hotel sector is facing, as well as the office building sector, to rapidly convert those into housing for people and not let those assets just sit there empty. Uh, we need to streamline our ability to get affordable housing into the ground and prioritize it over other development projects, because those are homes. Those are the future homes for people. Uh, I have been part of putting plans like that into place to ensure that we actually hit our goals. And I know that as mayor, I would be able to achieve that. Okay, thanks very much. Lori Sutton, tell us about affordable housing. All right, well, affordability is at the very heart of New York City's new value proposition. And of course, housing is at the heart of affordability. So here's how I see it. Um, I see that this is a time when, as Catherine said, with crisis comes opportunity. So all of the things that have been said in terms of the zoning, the community engagement early and often, the uh, different types of excess commercial conversion, hotel conversion. Yes, there's state and uh, local programs for converting thousands of units into single room occupancy. Uh, units which uh, have been very, very, very popular in the past with homeless uh, individuals, particularly single men. I think there are things that we can do that we just need to stretch ourselves to recognize that the pandemic, while it's been devastating, it has not brought every problem to our doorstep. We were 48 out of 50 states in terms of being least business friendly. We are still that way. In terms of social and upward mobility, we are at the very bottom 
with the rest of the blue progressive governed cities across the country, we have to really ask ourselves, what are we doing that can help particularly our brown and black communities that have been so left out for so long to live the lives with affordability, with respect, with dignity that they deserve. As mayor, I would do that. Okay, Andrew Yang, tell Thank us about you. Thank you, Errol. Thank you, Brooklyn. I mean, there, there are two very large related problems. Number one, affordable housing isn't affordable for a lot of people. And number two, everyone is for affordable housing in the abstract until it's pitched for their neighborhood and then uh, they're less for it. Uh, you know, and, and that's been the reality in New York for a long time. Uh, but Catherine referenced some of the big opportunities we have right now. There's a hotel operator who just turned in their keys to their lender the other week uh, because they have no business and they have mounting costs. And they said, I give up. <laughs> so there are many, many of these hotel operators that, in my view, should be turning those keys into the city um, because that's going to speed up our ability to develop um, properties. You don't need to build. You just need to repurpose some of these hotel properties. And the brutal truth is that some of this is going to happen with some of the commercial properties as well. Midtown Manhattan right now is 82% unoccupied. And even if we successfully get the city back on its feet, a lot of organizations are going to operate somewhat differently. They're not going to necessarily have everyone in five days a week. There's going to be this a balance of remote and in person, though I, I'm going to just mention right now that New York City needs people to come to the office. Like this is a place-based economy and we need to make that safe, but we also should recognize that things are not going to come back to the way they were. So that is to me the mammoth opportunity is that we have many unused spaces that need to be repurposed as well as trying to build uh, in some of the city owned lots. Okay. Um, folks, that brings us to the end of our time. We've got, of course, a lot more to talk about in um, other venues in the future, and I look forward to doing that with each of you. Uh, but for now, we're going to say goodnight, and uh, I want to remind everyone watching, uh, one purpose of this was to allow the Brooklyn Democratic Organization and the district leaders who are in charge of it uh, to kind of check the candidates out up close and figure out who they might want to carry petitions for, because petitions will be hitting the streets in just a few weeks. We're going to wish you all the best of, the, of luck. We'll see you out on the campaign trail. And thanks for joining us tonight. Thank, Thank you, Errol. Thank, Thank, Thank you, Rodney. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Thank Let's you. go, Nets. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, let's go. I, I also just want to thank uh, um, everyone for participating on Brooklyn's first debate. Uh, this is one of the largest Democratic county in the nation. And I just want to thank all the candidates for participating. Thank you, my, our moderator, Brooklyn's finance, uh, finance uh, Errol Lewis and our debate planning team. Thank you for tuning in on this no NFL Sunday uh, to hear the candidates. Again, my name is Assembly Member Rodney B. Short Hermlin, Brooklyn Democratic Party Chair. Thank you, everyone. Thank and you, Rodney. You're a pro. You need to get on TV like Errol. You can elbow him out. Very <laughs> natural. I'm, well, <laughs> I can never get Errol to <laughs> out. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Have a great night. Bye. Night. Thank you. Great night. See you guys.